All right, we'll get started. Uh, we'll start with the call to order and roll call. Director Hansen has indicated she will be uh, slightly delayed. Director Meek. Here. Director Myers. Here. Peterson here. Director Ray. Here. Director Williams. Here. Director Weiniger. Here. Okay, Pledge of Allegiance. We would all stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Director Hansen present. <laughs> um, right into the DCSD spotlight, over to uh, Superintendent Wise. Absolutely, you know, tonight uh, we get a spotlight, uh, uh, a bit of a student presentation that uh, really talks about engagement and the power of connection, the power of inspiring others to make a difference. And, and we take a look at this. This is a former student from Legend High School who is in a computer science class. And when you look at the opportunity to, to build an app, to build a business from the inspiration you get from a class, and now as alumni giving back, it's really a great spotlight uh, to, to really talk about that uh, next step and also that engagement and continued process to give back. So I wanna turn it over to the video to, to take a look. The relationship between people and computers really isn't that complicated. People tell computers what to do. Classroom lights on. Computers make people's lives easier. Yes, Mr. Stacey, turning classroom lights on. All right, please begin. That's the idea behind coding. We're using voice to turn off the lights, but when you actually see the code that was written to do that, you're, you're gonna realize it's really not that difficult. Really, coding is just a game. That's awesome, how did you do that? After a 20 year career as a software engineer, Mr. Stasiak decided he wanted to show students how to play. <laughs> You know, students that uh, have never coded before and students that, that are actually pretty good. And then there were students like Lance Schneider. I started taking Derek Stasiak's classes when I was a freshman. That was about four and a half years ago. Classroom lights off. It wasn't long before he had his own light bulb moment. You're turning classroom lights off. So when a student comes in late, the teacher may lose two to three minutes of class time. So he started telling computers what to do. Mr. Stasiak taught me all the basics. Now I'm taking the basics and using that every day to create something people can use. Something like an attendance taker. And now I have a barcode system that allows kids to scan in by themselves without a teacher anywhere nearby. Lance took his concept to the school district's IT department. As the product developed, the game began. I'm the owner of Lavent Systems. I started that company when I was a junior in high school at Legend High School. His work ethic is really one of the things I think that separates him from most. A game that keeps developing. My new system will go from preschools to high schools and it can go into every school across the country. A game that everyone wins. It's gonna save teachers a lot of time and it's very useful to every staff member in this building. All right guys, have a beautiful day. To recognize, uh, before break I was at Mountain Vista for a coding night and it was really a ninth grade coding night where you saw the middle school families come up and be a part of it also. So when you see that connection of of programming and coding. And then you also see starting a business in high school and continuing that business and what it can do not only in the daily life of our instruction and our, our practices, but also to, to capture uh, the work moving forward and the community piece. I just, how about a round of applause for Mr. Stasiak, Lance, and uh, this whole coding process. So, President Peterson, I'm gonna turn back over to you as we get going with this uh, study session and uh, uh, work with our family and, and, and uh, community engagement. Yeah, we have three items on the study session tonight. First one will be DCSD now and in the future. Then we'll move into one on parent and family engagement DCSD. And then finally, we'll be back to the superintendent with uh, COVID updates in the district. So without further ado, DCSD now and in the future, we'll have a presentation and then we'll open it up uh, folks for discussion and questions about the presentation. Thank you. All right, great, I guess this is where I come in. I get to take the lead on this one. So happy new year, everyone. Welcome back and no greater time um, to talk about DCSD now in the future than upon embarking on a brand new year here. Um, we've got some great things going on and some certainly some great opportunities in front of us. So um, to kick things off here, I just wanna share a little bit about what we'll be speaking about tonight. So these are just many, uh, these are just 
I guess, some of the many different things when we talk about the future in Douglas County School District. I really want to frame um, where we were when we, when we put this slide deck together <clears throat> and when we talk about this. We're talking about moving Douglas County School District forward, being the best that we can be for every single student that we serve in all of our neighborhood charter schools and in all of our programs across the entire district. Um, these are some areas that we identified are areas for growth, areas for us to improve, areas for us to get better and to become the best. And so um, we're gonna go through, we're gonna talk a little bit about compensation. You're gonna hear from Amanda Thompson, who's joining us virtually tonight. Um, I'll talk a little bit about safety and security. Uh, Mr. Rundle's gonna talk about special education, mental, mental behavioral health, and then preschool early childhood education with him and uh, Ms. Hyatt. And then also uh, speaking on transportation, and then uh, future needs and priorities for capital improvement and construction, Rich Cosgrove will be helping us with that. And then I wanna introduce uh, Nate Jones to you all, who's also uh, helping us with some of our engagement and talking about some of the next steps that we would like to engage our community in around these topics. So um, kicking things off, we're gonna move right into um, future compensation needs. So Amanda, can you, hear, can you hear us and can we hear you? I can. I, I can hear you all. It's great to hear all of your voices. Thank you for the opportunity this evening. Are we good to go? We're good to go. All right. Well, thank you for the opportunity um, to our board and our community to share of our future compensation needs. As you know, it remains our priority to um, continue to recruit the very best and retain the very best and show value to our employees through competitive compensation because ultimately we know that this impacts our students in such a positive way if we can ensure uh, that we have a positive uh, culture and climate, one of those being um, competitive pay. Um, in past presentations and in future, uh, we know that we do have current pay gaps internally um, as we compare our licensed staff and other staff to their credentials amongst each other. It has been um, a years long commitment uh, to rectify those internal pay gaps and then become more um, competitive externally. Um, and we do have a project that we have shared with you and we'll go into future detail on that that en enables us to um, one, uh, rectify those internal pay gaps and those compression issues. And then two, um, through uh, future compensation needs uh, continue to become more competitive. So um, as we previously shared, it is our goal in school year 22-23 to implement a new licensed pay schedule or schedules uh, for our general hard to hire and um, extremely hard to hire staff. And we do have allocated funding for that. And as we look at those, um, again, internal pay gaps, this will help us to rectify those. Now, um, we do remain lower in competitiveness in certain areas, such as our general schedule, but it is our goal to become more competitive after we make this initial shift. And that becomes part of our future needs in school year 23, 24 and beyond, not only for our licensed staff, but all staff. And so we would need that future um, sustained funding, that sustainability and predictability in our funding through this new structure for all employees to become even more competitive, um, knowing that they have uh, different funding um, allocations than we do. And we know that right now, um, we only have uh, a few years in which we um, can sustain this. And we do not wanna get to the point due to lack of funding to be in the point where we are in a pay freeze or a position cut or programming impact. Um, because our students are utmost uh, of the importance. And then we know that with the very best staff, we can ensure that our students are growing and learning and preparing them for a future world. So thank you for that opportunity to share. And Mr. Abner, if I can add in a little bit, as we start thinking about future needs, we think about where we are as a school district, what we're dependent upon. Uh, as a native of Colorado growing up, when I was going to school, state funding uh, was about 35% of what came into a school district and 65% was funded locally. Where we currently are, when you take a look at Colorado School Finances, we've heard different times with, with Kate Katask and with Amanda talking about uh, our, our needs for compensation. Uh, we're about reversed on that. When you think about it, we are about 60, 65% dependent on the state budget. When we think about Douglas County and we, we work together how we want to partner better for the future, 
uh, you know, one of the key pieces is really advocating what's best for Douglas County. How do we look at that local impact? And we think about uh, exploring those needs and what we can do to rectify. We want to be very purposeful uh, to take a look at what are we doing now for compensation? What's our sustainability? But what are our needs moving forward? Uh, we don't have the money for all teaching groups to compete yet. But we need to secure that. We value our teachers, we value our staff, and one of the things within this is having a clear perspective of uh, what would set the stage moving forward. So I think when we start talking about exploring the needs for, for a future mill levy override, when we start thinking about those capital needs as we're gonna talk about also uh, with future uh, perspective of bond work. I think those are the exploration that we start to say that we've seen a little bit of this in the past with compensation. I appreciate uh, uh, Mrs. Thompson's uh, work and her team with Kekataska to also share what that's gonna look like, but we also know that while it's a good start, uh, we have a lot of work to do. And we've identified areas within those groups in which we need to prioritize uh, to set the stage moving forward now uh, and in the future. So as we start talking about that in, in the past and present, we don't wanna get too much into what we've already presented, uh, but also create enough of a stage that's have dialogue about what this means and continue that work moving forward in, in the weeks and months ahead. One, one thing I want to just kind of reference is during my time as a principal, and I know Sid shares this with me most recently coming out of buildings, is that um, one of the most important things that we did was hiring and retaining and developing great staff members. They make all the difference. If we were meeting here during the day, um, they would be the ones that were in front of kids so we could have a meeting here, right? So um, they're in front of kids. And the same thing goes for all of our support. Uh, you know, student facing kids and all those in the background doing the work. There's nothing more important, quite frankly, than the people within our system. And I think our, you know, our allocation of resources speaks to that. Um, but it's an area where we have to improve. Um, as a principal, nothing broke my heart more than someone coming into my office saying, I, I love Rock Canyon High School. I love it here. I love working with you. I love everybody I work with, but I can't afford to stay here anymore. Um, I have a family, we're trying to save for college, whatever. I can't tell you the number of times I had those conversations, and I know I speak for all of my colleagues in the system that they had the same exact conversations. Since our HR team and our finance team has done some of the work with Step in Lanes, that has already improved. And so I wanna give you some anecdotal feedback. I was at a high school this morning, um, and the feedback that I got is overwhelmingly positive and supportive of the new Step in Lane system. And for the first time, in the past 10 years of this person's career as a high school leader, they've had three different employees come up to them and tell them they're thinking about getting their master's degree in administration um, for high school. And so they're valuing that higher, that opportunity to pursue that higher ed, that opportunity to do that now, it's driving them and they see the difference they can make in their own situation too. So I wanted to offer you that anecdotal information. I want to talk a little bit about why this is so important um, and why this is, in my opinion, priority number one, because of what it means to our system. It has the largest impact on our kids. And as a father and a longtime Douglas County School District employee, to me, that's, that's the most important. So we wanted to kick off with that and talk a little bit about that and share that with you. And we're gonna continue to share more. This is just round one of that compensation piece. Um, Obviously, we, we always talk about priority number one also being safety and security. It's hard to, to keep up with those two, but the fact of the matter is it's the people that take care of our safety and security, which goes back to that compensation piece. And so when we talk about future needs for safety and security, we want to make sure that everyone knows um, we've made some huge strides and we're doing some great things as it pertains uh, to this for our students, but we have, we have the ability to grow and to do a better job. And I think it's important that people understand that. First and foremost, when we talk about a culture and climate of safety and security, it's important that we recognize that when it comes to our schools and when it comes to the work that we do on a daily basis, our students are the number one security force in our schools. They know what's happening way before any administrators do, teachers, et cetera, because they're on social media, they're connected with their peers, they see warning signs. We have to foster a culture and climate in Douglas County School District where kids have trusted adults in school, where if they see something, if they feel something, if they hear something, they know it's okay to say something. And if they wanna remain anonymous, they use the safe to tell. We have had hundreds of tips come in this past spring or past semester 
that we've responded to and those that have come from students who are concerned about a classmate for one reason or another. We're able to work with our law enforcement partnerships and within our school systems and we're able to ensure that we're taking a safe approach to these situations. And so this remains priority number one within safety and security is fostering that climate and culture to make sure that we're intervening at a very early level when there's any concern about any students at all whatsoever. So continued training in that. Um, Mr. Rundle is going to talk a little bit more about mental health here in a little bit, and, and it, it remains important that we're staffing our schools with mental health professionals who can help us work through very difficult situations that come from things like threat assessments that we do with students and with families to ensure the safety of all of our students. And so that dives right into some of our professional development. Um, we have already begun doing professional development within our security teams. We're going to continue to do that. We're identifying areas of improvement for that, and we'll be doing full professional development for our entire system, system as we embark into next school year. And so I want to be clear that that remains a focus priority. We're also currently working with the I Love You Guys Foundation, and we're working on uh, planning and looking at a reunification exercise within Douglas County School District that we're doing with them. We have some upcoming meetings with them through one of our safety and security committee members, Carly Posey, who is involved with that organization. So some professional development, some good things there. Um, and we're looking at, um, as we move forward, what we really would like to do is increase our campus security specialists. Um, for those of you that have been out to visit our schools, especially our high schools who have open campuses, I think you can recognize a lot of vulnerabilities, as could anybody, right? You spend a day at Douglas County High School, you see a two-building campus where students are matriculating, you know, 1,800 students matriculating um, every 90 minutes. And so um, we believe that we need to increase campus security specialists, that we need to increase some different systems that we have across the board across our school district. Um, that largely comes in having more campus security officers. Right now, as we all talk about labor shortages and what the Omicron variant's doing to the labor, um, to our labor force, what we're recognizing is that it's very easy to get short in a lot of different areas in our, in our school district. And we don't want that to happen in the area of safety and security. And so we do need um, substitutes, if you will, floaters, people that are available should a team start to experience a loss or maybe there's you know, a turnover event or something like that that happens in a school. We need to make sure that our schools are covered. So we're talking about FTE. We do have to create a more competitive compensation system with our neighbors, um, not just in the public sector, but also in the private security sector there um, to make sure that we're covering all of that. And then we're also looking at adding some forensics tech type stuff, as well as hardware and software systems. Um, where we'd like to go with our, our threat assessment protocols is currently we do a very good job of, of um, looking at an individual, looking at their residence, if you will, their belongings, things like that. We want to go a little bit deeper into the technology. And so that's our next steps there and what we're looking at doing there, because that's where a lot of research indicates that we should be exploring and doing a better job with. So those are some of our future needs for safety and security. We do have a, um, a safety and security uh, committee that meets and council that meets once a month and Director Hansen and President Peterson are part of that every month. And so appreciate their insight and input on that. And as they could attest to, we have I think just about every agency there that could possibly be there, including now we have the DA involved helping us through some of these, um, guiding us through some of these future technology things that we're looking at doing in the future too. So um, that's really expanded um, over the course of the past few months. So future needs for special education, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Mr. Sid Rundle now who's gonna take us through the next two and a half, three slides. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Superintendent Abner. Um, Really important stuff, right? Compensation, safety, security. But all of it is just a warm up to the real stuff. <laughs> this is the most important conversation you're going to have tonight. It's my job to advocate for these programs, obviously, and I'm pretty passionate about these programs. And, and I'm so delighted to be, you know, able to be a part of telling the story of what we need, where we're at what we desire. I mean, really, the story that I want to tell in this slide and in the next couple slides are based on my conversations with our, you know, tremendous supporters and dissenters in the community, they, they all reach out to me, um, our advocates, our community members, our teachers, our principals, 
this really is more of a, of a constellation of what I've heard from them in terms of what do, they, what do our community members want for our children? What do they think our kids deserve? And so this is, a, a, you know, Superintendent Wise said I, I had to, to narrow my six slides down to one. Uh, so in no particular order, but somewhat prioritized, because I've got many, many more ideas that I can't wait to talk to you about. But these are some, I think, of the most pressing needs uh, that we have in, in the future. And again, it, not in any particular order, um, but for us to become, we, we're doing a really solid job in many areas. We're doing a really good job in some areas. I, I want us to be doing a great job. I want us to be a gold standard model district for our, our most vulnerable populations across the front range and, and in the state. And I really do think we can get there. I know we can get there because I believe in the will and the efforts of this community. Here are some areas that I think we need to shore up in the, in the next, you know, quite literally two to three to five years for sure that I think uh, have been neglected and, and we need to take care of. Our bridge transition program, uh, which is our, our programming for our post high school students that are transitioning into, into life and other life choices. Uh, you know, our obligation extends to our students until the age of 21. So it isn't just when they graduate from high school, we still have the opportunity to very, very much be there as, as why it's called bridge, bridging that, that gap. And to, to be honest with you, our bridge program right now is a, is a little bit of a uh, uh, of a motley uh, cobbling together of, of uh, you know, we've got some storefront spaces, we've got some newly renovated spaces, we've got some rented office spaces. I think this program deserves more than sometimes just, uh, you know, hand-me-downs and, and leftovers. I think this program really deserves some, some high-quality facilities, uh, you know, everything from laundry facilities to kitchens and things that are very much a part of that life uh, programming transition piece. You know, I don't, I don't know. I'd, I, I want it would be the kind of thing where I'd want the community to come together. Is do we do we want to look at the possibility of a consolidated campus? Uh, you know, if we're, we're, we're near public transportation would be my biggest ask. Um, or do we like better better the idea of the the satellite programs for you know because we're such a large geographic community? Those are important questions. Either way. Uh, we need to upgrade what we currently have in place for the, for that population. The the second one is is if you if you have not been to our Plum Creek Academy program, please I would love to give you a tour of that. I'd love to meet you and, and tour that facility. It really is a very high performing uh, gold standard program with a with a very very uh, intensive needs and challenging population. Um, interim uh, principal Lorenz is doing a fantastic job right now and and. It is a truly a, a remarkable program, as is evidenced by the fact that it is constantly at capacity. <laughs> there is there is never an open seat in that program. And, and as a former principal, much to my chagrin, the number of times I said, I have a kid that needs this program. And the waiting list is 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 always, you know, a factor, uh, always. So I think we need to build capacity, further capacity, whether we whether we you know, expand what we currently have. I, ideally, I would propose that we need to look at an east side of the district parallel program. It's, you know, Plum Creek, if you're familiar with where it is, it's about as far north and west as you can get and still be in Douglas County, right? It's, it's right on the corner of our county and, and truly a student that is, say, in the Ponderosa feeder area that needs that programming is just in for an awfully long, you know, uh, trans, transportation puzzle to get there. So Plum Creek Academy, we know we need to expand it location-wise. I'd love to see us uh, maybe have an East Campus. Similar to that is, and, and this one I know I'm going to hear lots and lots of cheers from my uh, uh, former middle school colleagues because for, for as long as I was an assistant principal, for as long as I was a special ed teacher, we, we knew when we had a student that was uh, really the perfect candidate for a Plum Creek type of placement. Just their specialized services were tailored for this kid. But Plum Creek is just for high school aged kids. And at middle school, we just had no options for placing, for placing kids like that into a program that we know they needed. And, and at elementary now, more so than ever before, we're seeing that same population and that same need as a real pressure point in the elementary school. 
again, this is not some new machination. This has been this has been an, an item on the burner for at least two decades that 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 I've been you know involved with Douglas County is what where is our Plum Creek Mini? Where is our Plum Creek Light program for our younger kids? And and it's just uh, something that we I think finally need to really confront. Vocational training facilities, uh, sheltered workshop types of opportunities. Again, with the the new exciting uh, stuff that we've been kicking around and talking about with our, our new campus acquisition. Obviously, I think that's re-energized, reinvigorated a conversation around, well, what about some of our populations that really could benefit from some very specialized, intensive programming. Um, you know, obviously we want them fully involved and integrated into the, you know, all of the CTE uh, opportunities, but specifically some of those, those tailored for our populations that need a little bit um, more, more intensive and specialized training. I'm thinking of teaching the autistic community the trades, TACT programming. There's a fantastic program down in Denver. I would love to see us uh, create something even better out here in Douglas County for our population. Um, one of the areas of opportunity that we know that we, we are needing to spend more time, resources, energy exploring is um, students that are on the autism spectrum, uh, ASD uh, category. Those are, are students that it's a very, very wide continuum. It's a very broad continuum. So there's no one profile, et cetera. But I'm not sure we have as, as comprehensive of programming for that unique population because again it, and that sort of feeds into something you see down below some of those students are twice exceptional they're very very uh, gifted cognitively um, but their their you know speech language disability their autism prevents them from accessing in other ways that requires some very specialized type of programming and uh, I'd like to see us scale that up Corey you want to win yeah you know one of the things is we look at our data we spend a lot of money also for outplacement. So when we look at yeah. the autistic spectrum, the needs not only within our schools, <clears throat> center-based, but also special programming, the cost savings we'd have, and also the ability to perform within, less of a distance. Uh, and also your, your goal in all of this, when you look at needs, is to build in uh, least restrictive. So how we can build the, the right programming and resources, and also bring back within our schools uh, is a goal. So I think when we look at this, not only do you see numbers uh, increasing, uh, but you also see the cost that we spend going out and how can we start to build that with, within our, our district currently and looking at the growth of the future. We'll be growing growth to close to 200,000 people over the next 20 years. So we start thinking about that current standard of the future. That's a, a clear piece of data that we also want to highlight. It's not just feedback and see the need, but it's also the data uh, of our enrollments and our growth. Yeah, and, and for, for the members of the community that are, that are listening in and, and talking a little bit of inside baseball, we're very aware that our, um, our affective needs programs that exist in our, in our neighborhood schools, currently they, they really service two populations, one being SED students or, or serious emotional disability students and students on the ASD, the autism spectrum. It was never really a design as much as it was an accommodation of we, we know we need something for these kids. And, and we've known for many, many years the needs of those two populations are significantly varied from one another, very much needing a different type of approach. And so putting them together in a singular program is, is, an, is an opportunity for us. We know we can do more focused programming. We know that we can uh, build, build better uh, interventions, therapeutic resources, et cetera, if we, if we can pull those two populations apart, it, we just need to, to figure out how to do that. And, and I think we can, but we're going to have to uh, invest the, the energy and the time and the resources into doing that. Specialized transportation, I, I won't get too much into that. I know that's a slide coming up. Um, of the front range districts, we just, you know, our, our greatest curse is lack of public transportation. And, and we know that the way you make programs sing for this population is in the community, um, accessing the, the, uh, the, the community, the resources, the museums, the, the shopping centers, all of that. And it's so challenging and difficult for us for, for all the obvious reasons we know now. But having a small fleet of some specialized transportation will really um, expedite in our feeder areas the, the ability to take those 
um, community outings, especially for our more impacted populations. But lastly, in terms of special education, an area that I'm really uh, passionate about and an area that I think is um, a, a very strong opportunity for us. It's, uh, I'll be very candid, very blunt. I think it's an area we have not tended to uh, exceedingly well uh, for quite some time for, for a variety of reasons, but that is the professional development of our people. I think we have fantastic people. I think we have the most dedicated, phenomenal people. But they show up to work and we, we work them to death, and then they go home and, and sleep and come back and we work them to death the next day. And, and there's so few days built into our calendar, into our schedule where we can say, I want you to pause, take a breath, sit back, and become a learner. And I want you to learn some new things so that you can go back and be better for your kids. We need to do that. We need to do that everywhere. But in special education in particular, high quality IEPs, as we know, the, the individualized educational programs, that's, the, that's the, the heart and soul of special education. This is the, the, the document that guides us in our efforts. And I just don't, I, I think we could use a lot of work as a system on how do we, how do we decide for ourselves what are gold standard criteria for well-written IEPs, well-executed IEPs. That goes along with the second point there of none of this makes any difference if we're not adequately progress monitoring and progress reporting. Our families need to know how is my kid doing? Is what we, what we sat around a table and talked about, is it working? Yes or no? And, I, and it can't be an end of the year or even a middle of the year. It needs to be a much more fluid and ongoing. And that takes, takes resources, it takes training, and it takes the opportunity for professionals to teach one another how to do that. So I think that's a really glaring need and opportunity for us. Executive functioning, we kind of talked a lot about that earlier this fall with our social emotional workshop, but that is, truly the, you know, the, the key towards any of our students and any of our populations becoming sturdier human beings, being able to transition and, and take advantage of what life has to offer. It's about those executive function skills. And we know there's a tremendous growing body of, of literature and research on what that looks like. And, we, and we, need to, we need to really jump into that conversation and, and appropriate that for our, our teachers and then for our kids. We've talked a lot about structured literacy, just continuing to enhance those opportunities. Twice exceptional, I think, is a real opportunity for us. Uh, I think that that is a population that is uh, a little bit invisible in our system, right? Because they are so capable in some areas and then fall off the map in other areas. And I don't know that we always know what to do with that and how to, how to, how to help the, the, the adults that work with that population understand the best way to, to, to be there to intervene with you know, the struggles or challenges they're facing. Uh, moderate needs, best practices. Again, this is a sort of a, a, a sliver group. We, we have this category called mild moderate, uh, you know, which is predominantly comprised of, of uh, specific learning disabilities and speech language deficit types of uh, disabilities. But again, that's a very, very broad continuum of students. But at one end of that continuum is a, is a subset of kids who are close to the cusp of needing more of that real intensive significant support needs, but they're not quite there. They've got enough adaptive skills. They've got a, a high enough IQ that they're, they're accessing it a little bit higher than what those programs can offer but we know that they struggle tremendously when they're put into a general, even with a special education consultant or support or resource class, they're gonna struggle. We call those, for lack of a better word, kind of betweeners. They're, they're kind of between two programs and I think we need to figure out how do, we, how do we better build a foundation for those students and that's all about training our teachers. It's all about training our, our leaders, our principals and uh, our teachers. What, what do we do to support those students uh, in, in their learning in maximizing educational assistance, right? I mean, I think for too long we've, we've, we've thrown money at more and more educational assistance and then we found educational assistance are really hard to come by now. <laughs> and are we, are we utilizing the ones that we have? Are we taking advantage of how smart some of these people are and how much we can access what they bring to the table and not just um, you know, sending them to go sit next to a kid in a class. But that, 
that is time and intentional training that, that we need to attend to. So that's my short list. I can't wait to talk about more. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that later, but I think uh, Superintendent Abner is, is giving me the nod. So for uh, mental and behavioral health, uh, again, not in any particular order, but, but, but needs that I don't think I'm gonna have to convince anybody on. These are needs that you all have been telling us for a long, long time, and, and our, and our uh, community taxpayers have been telling us for a long time. And that, so that first item is really a celebration. We were able to put counselors in all of our elementary schools, and we, we have a lot of pride as a district at being the district that said, we're gonna do that. Most districts don't. That's still a, still a rarity to have counselors at the elementary school. We said every one of our schools was going to have that position. That was a great start. That was a great start. But we also recognize that the, the recommended national standard for counselors is 250 to one. Well, some of our elementary schools are, are well over 700 students and they have one. So that's a, that's a ratio that we, we did right by getting the counselor. Now we need to, to do the next steps of trying to bring those ratios down. I don't know that we'll ever get to 250. That's a, that's, you know, a system our size, that's a big lift. It's hard to find counselors. We kind of drained the pool. We, we hired all the best and, and now we're fishing and we found that we caught them all. There's not, not many more swimming around, but uh, we, we need to try to bring those ratios down a little bit. Same with uh, school psychologists and social workers. Uh, the idea of having a full-time dedicated staff member, not somebody who travels between buildings, not someone who's in this elementary on Tuesdays and Thursdays and every other Friday, but is always in that building as a, as a mental health professional, in my mind, is essential. M more now than ever. We've, we've probably known that and felt that for a long, long time, but we've suddenly found ourselves in this crisis moment in our history of saying, boy, these people are essential to have on call at all times in our buildings, the level of uh, mental health interventions, the level of threat assessment, the level of suicide assessments. We're, we're seeing such a tremendous um, uptick in those things. And we know that the, the stress it's putting on our itinerant staff especially, going between schools, not being where they need to be and getting a call from the other school that I need to be over you know, somebody else. That's a real uh, important need. Again, logistically, hard, hard position to fill right now. Um, but I, I'm still gonna say it's worth, it's worth going fishing. Behaviors in general are an issue that our leaders and our community are telling us are something that, are unprece that is unprecedented in terms of crisis right now. Students are more dysregulated. Uh, students are more, are more emotionally uh, needy. Um, we're seeing much more um, uh, just sort of uh, dysregulation, I think would be the word I'd use, in our, in our classrooms, in our schools, just kids really struggling to understand how this works. And the pandemic did not help that, but I would tell you this started before the pandemic. We were noticing a lot of this type of, of uh, dynamic. I, I really think that we have a lot of work to do in terms of more, more uh, behavior teams dedicated, especially for our earlier learners in our elementary schools board certified behavior analysts or registered behavior techs, they can, be, they can be game changers in terms of being there to intervene, I take that back, not to intervene, to coach alongside, to build the capacity of the staff in those elementary schools. The number of calls myself and my team get of saying, Look, we, we, just, we need someone to come out and just give us some tricks. How, how do we help this kid? This kid really just needs some, some support, and our staff needs to know effectively how to work with the student. We're hearing that from all of our schools, but especially our elementary schools um, right now. Again, professional development um, for our, our psychologists and social workers, uh, that's its uh, gold standard level of, of uh, training, especially in induction and, and making sure that we're uh, doing due diligence to keep them current on the, the credits that are required for them to stay certified and, and licensed. That's something that I know districts are starting to use more as an incentive to hold and retain, and that's a huge end statement or a, a huge strat plan goal of ours is how do we retain the best of the best. That's very, very much one of those areas I think that's an opportunity for us. Uh, 
Deputy Superintendent Abner talked about the psychological uh, safety team. And more so than ever are we saying, boy, are we glad we've got great people here. But it's a pretty cobbled together team. We've got stipends that we're paying for some people coming out of schools that'll, that'll be able to respond and be a part of that work. We've got you know, a, a lead over here and a lead over there. I really think we need to, to, to put together a more structured and robust psychological safety team that is dedicated solely to crisis response, prevention, intervention, postvention, and, so, and, and a team that that really becomes their full work. We, we've, we've never seen more of a need for that work than we are uh, right now, obviously. And then PD for going back to that first top item for our elementary school counselors, that professional development piece. Um, right when we, the taxpayers blessed us with that uh, allocation of funding and we began hiring those counselors, we no sooner got those people in place and then, uh, you know, the, the world sort of took a turn uh, in a different direction. And so we we have not had the opportunity to truly define roles for those counselors, responsibilities for those counselors, to train them, uh, to induct them, and to mentor them appropriately in all the things that an elementary counseling program needs to entail. Um, we've been doing it at a secondary level for quite some time, but it's a pretty very, a very, it's a very different gig at high school than it is at middle school. And at elementary, it's, a, it's its own animal as well. Superintendent Wise? And you know, as Mr. Rundo talks about that connection of, of the bond and MLO of 2018, and you look at our community support. This morning I was uh, at a meeting, which is getting ready for the legislative kickoff, the 120 days of our legislative work. So our senators that represent Douglas County, our board of county commissioners and that work ahead. You know, one of the things I think that we echo when we take a look at, as we start to say our assessment and we start to align the work of our entire community, we need to engage and ask for those priorities. But I also want to say, you look at the work in the, the state work towards mental health and behavior support. Our county commissioners work towards behavior uh, support and mental health. Uh, our Douglas County Youth Initiative, in which many of you are part of and serve uh, within that, this aligns with that. Um, the needs and the money, it's ever changing. But it also brings us back to a community. So as I stated earlier a little about uh, Douglas County, who are we? Who are we as a community? What are we going to support? And supporting Douglas County for who we are, it's a great way to really align that and to really set not only a need, but uh, a common purpose. And so I think as we think about uh, each of these, how we can look at that centralized piece of aligning resources, uh, work together to do that, the wraparound where it's not just a one-time piece, but how we really wrap around individuals and families over time and do it as an entire community. So really just uh, hearing that this morning, hearing that process of values and process of next steps within it really resonates again uh, of, of our start of uh, not only addressing what are our needs, but also really saying as a community, what do we support, what do we prioritize, uh, and hearing a little bit of that, that commonality. We're gonna, we have, we have another topic within a little bit of the, the idea of, of compensation and, and people. Uh, within needs, and then we really want to kind of open up for a little more discussion and conversation, and then also get in a little bit of the capital needs next. Uh, so just as we go uh, timing-wise, we look at uh, slides and, and purpose, okay? I think that was Corey telling me, uh, Rundle, move, move on, move on here. Well, let's talk about ankle biters. Uh, so uh, our, our future needs of our of our uh, early childhood education preschool program. Um, you know, th this one is interesting. I only have three bullet points, but they're all three pretty important <laughs> and pr pretty big things for us all to have on our radar um, because the uh, uh, early childhood education east would be, a, would be a proposed need of ours because the Parker area is blowing up. The Parker area is uh, blowing up in a good way in a family kind of way. There are kids hanging from ceilings all over in, in Parker. Our capacities are maximized. Therefore, our child find assessments, uh, all the things in Parker are just in, incredibly, uh, the, the rubber band is stretched about as thin as it can be right now. And uh, we, we know that we need some attention in that area. It's more than just preschool classrooms. It's also spaces for uh, our uh, you know, early childhood child find assessors to come in and evaluate developmentally where these kids are at, what their needs are, working with families, et cetera. That's an important piece that you, know, you, you can't just do that in a 
coffee shop. You need, you need a location to do that type of thing. Um, we know also that preschool classroom space in general is, is a premium, not in all of our regions. Some of our regions we've got capacity and that's a no brainer, but those aren't where the kids live. They're in Parker in particular, uh, North Parker, and, and uh, that's where we really need to figure out solutions for those families because it's very challenging to, to transport your, your young four-year-old you know, to a completely opposite side of the district, especially for a program that's you know, only a, a half-day program. Um, with the advent of universal preschool coming uh, a year, year from July, you, I wish I could tell you we, we are certain what those known needs are. And we, we, we don't yet know. The state does not yet know. We just know there will be uh, needs. And we will need to be agile. We'll need to figure out transportation, space, uh, programming for that for that program uh, it, when it begins to ramp up. And that'll, that'll really start happening, I predict, this spring considerably. And as we go into the summer, and then we kind of hit that we're a go one year from now, I think things are going to start happening really fast and we're going to want to be ready for that. And so I would just add to that, that this is like a perfect time and a perfect opportunity for us to start to really um, vision forward with what our preschool and early childhood education program looks like in Douglas County. I think we do a fabulous job right now, and that's led by Lisa Graham, our director of preschool. However, we don't just also want to be confined with what what the state ends up saying we are having to do when it comes to our uh, preschool or early childhood education program. We're taking this as an opportunity to say, what is our current state? What's our desired state? And we started to engage in some of those conversations with creating essentially a task force, a project team that's um, reflective of our community and many different stakeholders to help us with the visioning process. So that's exciting on top of the needs we have right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Exactly. L last item on there is, is uh, again, I, I, we're seeing um, a, a lot more demand and a lot more need for early identification and intervention. And that's an area we know we need we, is an opportunity for us to, to identify and intervene as early as possible with our young learners. Uh, because we know that's where the most successful interventions take place. And uh, again, I I'd like to see a dedicated director, assistant director in that area in particular, just because we know the, the capacity right now is, is uh, overwhelming what, what our current resources are. Part of the, the director or assistant director, as Mr. Rundle just spoke about, one of the things we are also really concentrating on is the alignment around our reading programming. Um, not just K-6 or K-8, but pre-K-6. And so um, um, our preschool teachers being able to access some of the resources that we're exploring and aligning has been a conversation we've been having as well. So. so I started with our oldest learners and then our youngest learners. How was that for symmetry? Yeah, great. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right, Mr. Cosgrove. Good evening, directors. I'd like to first discuss transportation and then migrate into capital needs. There's obviously a lot of crossover. Um, I want to mention on this slide, except for the last one, every sentence starts off with restore. And I'd like to understand the board's um, discussion slash guidance on how to prioritize transportation to restore. I'd like to start off with basically 2017-18 there was a sea change in this district starting with transportation. And a lot of people think of transportation in that context and it's significantly different now and I'd just like to give you some examples. 2017-18. So in 2017-18 we had a 289 budgeted headcount drivers. And understand an FTE is not necessarily a headcount, it depends on, on the FTE. We currently have 225 budgeted. That's 77% of what we had budgeted in 17-18. We currently have 61 vacant driver positions on top of that. So at the end of every day, we have 164 budgeted headcount drivers in our three terminals. Compare this to 289 in 17-18. During that time frame, we typically had 20 to 30 vacancies. Now we're up to 61. We typically hover around 50. 
On top of that, we have 23 vacant transportation educational assistant positions. So every day at 5 a.m., the terminal managers and their route schedulers have a phone call. It's the way we've always done it, not just COVID, but always. Then 12.30 and then 5.30, so three times a day in order to determine vacancies and cover routes. So when we started this school year, we had 141 drivers for 140 routes. Now we're up to 152. It just depends on leaves of absence, illnesses, COVID, call-ins, six, anything like that, schedule vacations. So we are able to cover our routes, but they've changed significantly. So let me give you some parameters. And I'm going down this slide in, in order. Our overall ridership in 1718 was 12,000 students. Now it's 6,700. Our gen ed routes, general education, back then it was 155, now we're down to 84. And our routes for students with special needs was 98, now it's 64. Obviously there's a less reduction there. And the reason we're able to meet our routes, and I'm jumping to the uh, slide about walking distances here, is because we've consolidated routes. Every single day we consolidate routes. Every single day. And the riders, the parents, the students, who's ever signed up for the smart tag notification to get a notice. It says route cancellation. Well, we've only canceled one route this year, and that was yesterday for three students because of driver shortage. We've combined routes. Well, we're able to meet that one mile radius to the elementary schools and two miles for middle and high because we've lengthened the routes. A typical route is 45 minutes from the first stop to the school. And that's the way we've been able to consolidate and to maintain our priority per board policy, the one and two mile radius. Unfortunately for our kids, and I'm a parent as well in this district, those, those kids are on the bus longer and they have to walk further to a bus stop. Sometimes, sometimes they'll have to walk a mile to a bus stop. That's the only way with this few drivers. And so it is a significant impact. As far as the central staff, our mechanics, our route schedulers, our dispatchers have been reduced by 50%, cut in half by 1718. So we have three terminals. We have one dispatcher per terminal, one scheduler per terminal. If that employee is sick, we have a manager filling in with less expertise, but total commitment, and we get the job done, but it is a significant challenge. Uh, we also, by the way, have driver trainers. They're driving routes right now, so that's impacting our training, but we need to fill internally, and we are. And this was pre-COVID, too. On any given day, we have one of three managers. The manager driving routes. The director of transportation, Donna Curtino, often drives a route. Um, the walking distances, again, they are maintained. In general, we maintain the one and two mile radius. Not always, sometimes it's a little further out, especially in the North Parker area and the Shap feeder uh, because of the challenges. But uh, in general, we're able to maintain those. Gated communities. Um, the board policy correctly says that we will not have stops on private roads. Typically, they don't have curbs and gutters, they don't have lights, they're not plowed, they're not maintained like a public right-of-way. Gated communities are private. They're owned by the HOEs. HOAs, it's fee-based. It's not tax-based as far as their maintenance. So in 1718, we were going above board policy. We were going in gated communities. And some of these gated communities, especially Castle Pines, are huge. And because of the cuts, we basically backed off those stops and put the stops at the gates. That's a burden for the students because they have to walk to the gate to get on the bus. So that's something that we would hopefully be able to restore someday. Field trips, they are real, they're impactful. Um, we have field trips during the day, after school, and on weekends. We call the day field trips midday field trips. And for, for many programs, in 1718, we did 5,000 field trips. This year, so far, we've done 300. Because our priority is to use the drivers for the morning and afternoon routes and during the midday special education routes, including special education preschool. We have anywhere from 60 to 80 midday routes. And we, we want to do field trips. We have drivers that want to do field trips. And we want to honor that, but they're having to be reassigned to middays. 
So um, it's, it's a tough decision, but we base it on priorities. Um, we used to provide routes for International Baccalaureate, Alternative Education, um, DC Oaks, and the IB programs. They were regionalized. We had a bus route that started in Parker and came all the way to DC Oaks. We had to eliminate those. Um, we even had routes for band, certain band programs from school to school. And unfortunately, we had to eliminate that. Um, and I say this as a parent, too, because I would have to go pick up my son from a track meet because our routes have always been one way for athletics. And it would be ideal to have two-way routes for athletics. But um, at this current state, we're prioritizing. We're working with Andy Abner, with Derek Cheney, athletics and activities to prioritize what uh, field trips we can provide. And Sid mentioned preschool. So this isn't restore. This is something new. We would like to have routes for preschool. And these would be throughout the day because they're only half day. We've envisioned how we could do that. Um, based on so many schools per route per feeder, unless that preschool student rode a typical bus with older grades, and I understand there may be concern with that. So during the board onboarding, I'll discuss more detail about some options for that. But these are basically the areas that we are aware of. And um, for example, if a school wants to hire a charter bus for an activity, they can do that. The site-based budget, we have a pre-qualified list of charter buses on our strategic source and website, but that's $500 to $1,000 one way. And so it's very expensive to fill the gap compared to a district employee. But the reason is not only the past budget cuts in the central staff from the district, but also because of our current salary range, which is slightly under, not much, but slightly, other districts, and the national shortage of commercial driver's license drivers. So it's a, it's a bad, perfect storm, and that's leading to our vacancies. Yeah. You know, when we think about restoring cuts, we think the easy answer is we'll just hire people. But as Rich just said, we've had vacancies for many years that we cannot hire. Even if, we can't com even if we can compete with neighboring districts, neighboring districts who pay a little bit better have vacancies they cannot hire. We need to ask our community, what's it worth to have more routes? We get a lot of feedback of convenience, radius, length of time. How can we do it better? But we're going to have to decide, is it worth paying to, say, private level? And even in the private sector, CDL drivers are shortages. Um, are we able to pay that much? Do we want to pay that much? And to what expense? So I think so those are some things we have to reach out and engage and survey and get that feedback of what do we value. We know what we want, but what are we willing to get behind and go for? And I think that's where we go through with all these priorities. But in all reality, we, we get a lot of feedback on transportation. And I'm going to give a kudos. We talked about COVID. We have three drivers that are down today. We didn't miss a single route. So when you talk about, we don't have a lot of coverage and people to be able to cover. You don't have backup drivers like we have substitute teachers, which uh, we'll get into some of that side. But even when you have uh, three drivers that, that, that are out right now, um, we, didn't want, we don't want to miss routes. We might have to. We might have to look at cancellations, but we're, we find ways where people are doing more. So you look at our transportation, you look across our system. The one kudos I want to give to everybody, everybody is stepping up and willing to do more right now. And it says a lot. I want to say thank you uh, to each of those. But, but it's important for our community here that, that no one wants to have these vacancies. Everyone wants to have the answers, but there's not one easy answer in a lot of these things. And we have to prioritize, make decisions, and, and put value. And, and that's a good part about this. All these discussions are about local, Douglas County, Douglas County investment. Investment in our schools, investment in our kids. And uh, that, that's a key piece that I just want to continue to, to, to throw out there. So. Rich, uh, please pass along back to, to everybody again, uh, the work that you have, the stepping up, and, and especially right now, uh, the coverage of, of not missing those routes. Thank you. And before I go on the next slide on capital needs, um, to Corey's point, I've never been more impressed by a group of employees as a transportation department. They have a can-do, will-do attitude, and it amazes me. So we had three drivers out today. That's a total of nine. And... Um, just with the daily call-ins, the rework that they do every day to combine routes last minute and 
nobody wants to do this more than the transportation department. So I just have constant praise for them. So thank you. Okay, next slide. Um, I've got four slides on capital needs. The first two are on fixing stuff that's there. The last two are on capacity, providing stuff that we don't have. So many of you have been exposed to the master capital plan, the definition of tiers and priorities. So a tier is a designation of a component based on the importance on the building and site. It never changes. Tier one is like your heart. Tier four is like your fingernail. It's important, but they have different impacts on the building. The priority always changes. The priority is based on the actual condition of an asset. Typically, the older it gets in the life cycle and the use, the higher priority it is. So in theory, a tier one high priority is, my goodness, what needs to be fixed. Okay? Sometimes a tier two high priority is more important than a tier one low priority because it needs to be addressed there now. So if you look at tier one, these are typically the components that can render a building not occupiable, either by code or by risk or by hazard or because of the damage to the building. Uh, typically, it's your mechanical, electrical, plumbing. About 85% of your tier one is that. And that's typically the most expensive items in any building. Then it's the building envelope, the, the roof. Then tier two affects a section of a school or a learning program, like an artificial field, um, flooring, carpet. It's not just look, but it's indoor air quality and tripping hazards. Um, then we look at tier three, which is basically the learning environment. It's important, but will it close the school? No. Will it impact learning and affect morale? Yes, it will. Tier four, it's what will get written up from our HOA if we don't maintain our lawn, we like native grass in the district because it's sustainable and maintainable, but um, you know it is important, but not as important as the earlier tiers. These conditions never change, and this algorithm never changes, but I will say, as we reported to the Mill Bond Oversight Committee in June, we have needs that come up unexpectedly. While we have life cycles programmed into our facility capital plans, when the chiller at Sage Canyon or the chiller at Sagewood or the cooling tower at Prairie Crossing go down, you have to fix it. You can't say, well, it's not due yet, so we're not going to cool the building. That was unprogrammed. That was not in the 2018 bond. So thanks to the voters and to the Board of Education, we have bond premium that we were able to use to address that. So the conditions change. And so we have to be flexible in our bond planning to make sure we have contingency and we've included these. Next, so I discussed the needs at schools and buildings, and those are neighborhood, magnet, alternative, and charter schools. These are needs that are district-wide that support all of the district that are not tied to a building. And Sid's mentioned many of these, and so is Corey and Andy. So security infrastructure and equipment. The equipment has to be replaced, and there are improvements needed. Security is a significant investment in a school as far as dollars and capital. It's the number one priority. There's cameras, wirings, controllers, servers, radios, window filming. Um, we have needs to continue to improve the entrances to our schools. And you can see different schools, the new elementary versus the old elementary versus the middle and what the entrances look like. So there's a lot of improvements that can be done as well as on the site. Information technology. I know that we could not live without IT. And this gets to the computer refresh of all of our computers, to the uh, um, multi-device equipment, to the uh, wiring, to the access points. There's a lot that goes into IT that needs to be refreshed or replaced. Americans with Disability Act. Our buildings are 100% code compliant, but the ADA Act has different layers of improvements that you can make to buildings, and we can be proactive or reactive as far as how do you alter toilet fixtures or, or doorways to provide access for a student or teacher that needs that access? Um, special education facility upgrades from calming rooms, center-based programs um, in all of our schools. And this is a student population that continues to grow by the numbers, so we need to continue to address this. We talked about transportation. In this bond, we purchased a number of vehicles. We actually discarded more 
buses than we purchased. That is a testament to how old our buses were. Um, and we're able to meet auto routes from a bus perspective. That's not the constraint. The lack of drivers is the constraint. But we still have buses that are that over 300,000 miles on them. And just the amount of tools needed in our three terminals, it's significant. So this uh, is something that will be in our plan. Athletic field, track resurface, and then amenities. Our typical high school competitive artificial field lasts 11 years in this environment with the UVs. Every 11 years, we should replace an artificial field. And we do. Uh, we want it to withhold rubber. We don't want the seams to come apart. We want it to be safe. Tracks with the differential settlement and the wear and tear, we need to resurface tracks periodically. Thank you to the voters in the 2018 bond. We're good for tennis courts because we took up all the asphalt tennis courts and put post-tension concrete down. So we're good. Uh, but we still have the tracks and fills to work our way through. Just because we did them in this bond doesn't need doesn't mean we won't have them in the next bond because they're all coming to, to life on a periodic cycle. Playground equipment. This is not to expand or to um, have discretionary equipment. This is for preschool licensure. It gets down to the four-foot fence and the percent of shade structure on preschool playgrounds so they can get licensed. Um, also, because of either vandalism or rust and wear and tear, we simply need to replace equipment on playgrounds. Mobile classrooms. The average age of our 122 mobiles in the district is over 25 years old. So we need to repair them, and eventually we either need to discard them with permanent construction or replace them um, as they continue to age. And furniture replacement. This is not discretionary also. Many of our schools have the original furniture of when they opened. So this is old and it gets beat up. And plus, learning is continuing to change. So instead of desks facing all the same direction with the table connected to the chair, we, we want to get away from that. So that's part of this bond as well as uh, future needs. For new construction, everything I'm saying is consistent with the Master Capital Plan and thanks to the Long Range Planning Committee again. In the Master Capital Plan, we have one to five year needs and six to 10 year needs. Everything I'm showing you here is on the one to five year needs, but it's not everything in the Master Capital Plan. These are the most urgent needs. Um, so as Corey said, we're 69% the size of Rhode Island in this county. It's large. We have aging communities and we have booming communities. In general, the aging communities are outpacing the booming communities. So in the overall, our enrollment continues to slightly decline, but we have pockets that are really growing fast. I mean, five to six homes a week. And so these are the areas where boundary changes won't solve. These are geographic voids where we need new construction because of the distance. So the canyons is right across on I-25 and Hess. It's in Castle Pines. It's just on the east side of um, I-25. And uh, many thousand units, and it's growing fast. We have Crystal Valley, so just south of here, west of I-25. And that growth is significantly impacting Southridge, Cass Rock Elementary, all of the schools in this area. That's why several years ago, with the board's approval, we shifted sixth grade from Sage Canyon and Southridge into Mesa because of the capacity reason. Um, and Sterling Ranch. Sterling Ranch is a third of the size of Highlands Ranch. Eventually, it'll be its own feeder. One high, one middle, three elementary schools. And we need a school in the next five years for that growth. Right now, there's capacity at Ranch View and Thunder Ridge. But if you look at Cowdy Creek, already exceeding the ideal program capacity, Trailblazer soon after. And that's not very convenient for the kids or the parents to go all the way one way. And the, the traffic is significant twice a day and the time. Mesa Middle School. It is partially um, housing sixth grade from the two elementary school. It's not a full deployment. It's not ideal for learning. And for learning, but also for capacity, we need an addition to Mesa Middle School. Those are the top priorities for capacity. Closely behind that, and I mean almost neck and neck with priority one, the chaparral feeder, 
along the Meridian Village and Sierra Ridge Elementary site, we need a school. If you look at Prairie Crossing, it has five mobiles and it's busting at the seams and it has been. And thanks to the board, we've had several reboundering adjustments there, but it can't solve the problem in the long term. If we don't build an elementary school there, you could do an addition to Sierra Middle School to house all of the sixth grade in that feeder. And that would free up capacity at the elementary school. So there, it's an elementary school or a middle school expansion. And then down near Franktown. So Ponderosa High School growth is coming. It's the only feeder with only three elementary schools. Most feeders have five. It is coming. And with, uh, with Franktown, Northeast, and Mountain View, they will have capacity issues very soon. And Franktown is on a well in septic. So we physically could not do an addition to that school or fire sprinkle it. So we need a school at Cobblestone Ranch or the Northeast Castle Rock area. So these are the most urgent needs for growth. Okay. And here's the new construction needs for programming. So not capacity, not new student count, but for programming. So as Sid said, we have had in the master capital plan for years a special education K-8. Plum Creek is a high school that's 19,000 square feet. We're looking at uh, 25,000 square feet to uh, have dual diagnosis to very quickly reintegrate those students with typical learning. And so we have that need for programming. We have alternative education, as mentioned. Bridges being one of them. But uh, in the West Highlands Ranch area, there is a void. We have uh, Teddy Lane. We have D.C. Oaks soon. Thanks to you, we're going to have the Innovation Center. But in West Highlands Ranch, we, we need some presence there. Cloverleaf is the district homeschool program. And that continues to grow. There are 250 students in it now. It could easily go up to 350 if we had the uh, suitable space available. Preschool rooms, where you have the rooms, they're full. Where you don't have the rooms, we need them. And it's basically supply and demand. And a preschool room has different requirements than a typical room, unless you get waivers from Department of Human Services. So do you put one room at every school, one room per feeder, two rooms per feeders? We're coming up with options. But we don't know the need yet, but we know that we will have the need. We want to continue to explore middle school grade configuration. Right now, we have three middle schools, six through eight. The rest of them are seven and eight. So those would be a capital need based on what the vision is and how we implement that in the district. Standardization of amenities. There are a few schools that don't have what the other schools have. Um, best case is Ponderosa High School. They only have four tennis courts. Every other high school has six. And they have to go to the Pinery to play tennis. That, that's an impact on that community. And we have a few other cases like that. Um, and then the Innovation Center. We have phase two, phase three, that will be capital needs, and career and technical education. Thanks to a great bond, we had CTE and expanded in all nine high schools, but we know that there will be continued growth in that program. So this is a summary of the district-wide programs that support every school across the district. Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap us up here real quickly and just talk about next steps. This is really around engagement. I want to introduce Nate Jones. Nate, are you right back here? This is Nate Jones. He's going to help us with our next steps. So we've identified these areas. Um, we want to hear from you. We want to hear more from our community. We want to make sure um, that all of our community and all of our stakeholders agrees with the things that we put forward to you all tonight. So our next steps will bringing our community together to talk about these. And you can see a variety of different things there. I'm not going to read through those, but those will be our next steps. Nate's helping us lead through those next steps. And we're already working on putting some different opportunities for presenting and getting feedback surveys, et cetera, in the future. So that's those are our pieces for you. I know that was a lengthy presentation. Thank you all for your attention. I think at this time we'll entertain any questions or discussion in regards to it. Corey? Yep. So, you know, in this next steps, we are exploring, we're setting up timelines, we're setting up priorities, but then we need to survey. Uh, what is it that we have? What do we have in common? What's our, what are our priorities as an entire community to start looking at what, what next steps are? So we want to open up questions for you. Uh, this is not a one-time event. 
this is something that we need to build on going with us, along with our, our, our staff and our community, uh, but we really want to open up for questions within that. And also to say one last thing, is we're exploring a bond and MLO. In the past, we've always said, it's not a one-time fix. Um, when you look at school districts and a local base in Colorado, uh, we are a local uh, state, which is a great thing, uh, but it's reasonable amounts over reasonable times. And when you think about that, uh, what does that look like? The last bond in MLO was in 2018. So we started assessing needs and get back out to the community. We really want to make sure that, that we continue to uh, be responsive, uh, look at our priorities, and look at standards of measure. Uh, centers of excellence and and really define that together so again uh what question do you have we'll pass the microphones and we can go in deeper and continue this process and one quick thing i just wanted to add is that um all of these next steps as you look at any of our opportunities to engage with the community we really value our board of education being with us and so I just want to let you know that you absolutely will be invited. We would like you to be part of that. We would also like to ask for your help as we present and as we engage with our community. So please know that that'll be forthcoming and you'll be hearing from Nate or myself or another member of cabinet. So thank you. Directors, any questions? Uh, Director Myers? Or, oh, sure. You just passed. Just. Just, just passing the mic. Um, one question I may ask of uh, the superintendent and the rest of the cabinet members here. Um, previously, I believe we had a joint subcommittee that was made up of members of LRPC, FOC, um, maybe even MBOC, maybe appropriate this time from a lessons learned perspective. Is, is that something uh, that you think we should stand up and we can formally do as a board, stand that up, request membership from our individual committees, and then maybe even some outside um, members of the community? Because I heard a lot of stuff here, all good stuff. Um, but we mentioned, or I, I listened to Mr. Cosgrove mentioned, hey, we got to get back to the way we used to do business. Things were okay, and we've been kind of doing it ad hoc since. I think at the macro level, the bond MLO cycle for us here in the district is like that. We used to historically pass bonds and MLOs, um, you know, on a, on a fairly routine basis. Things were happening, and then 2008, the entire train got off the, you know, got off the tracks, and we went over 12 years without a bond. And what do you get after a decade of no bond? You get tier one, pry ones, a couple others, and you're forced, your hand is forced. Um, so my question to you would be, would it be helpful for this board to set up a joint subcommittee to assist with this with members of our standing committees and community members? And two, I think we would charge them with assisting in that communication, lining up things uh, like that, you know, looking at all the priorities, both MLO and bond and other areas. And then finally, I think they, their look uh, should be beyond this year, but also include something to normalize the process going forward. This year, these are the priorities as the group sees it as you know, coordinated with the board and the community and everyone else. But I think we also need to look at next bond, next bond, next bond, and MLO phase one, phase two, phase three, whatever they would look like to get where we want to go. So would that be useful from the board? Yeah, so I'm going to, it actually is a great segue into what engagement looks like. So in our next, in our next topic of dialogue and work, I think we want to build on that further about uh, ownership. How do, what's our roles? How do we help all of us um, determine our next steps. But I do think using our committees and using the past experiences to do that, trying to create how do we start to leverage um, what were those quality practices that worked well? What will we tweak differently? How are we going to improve and what are our current needs? And we start to say in bond and MLOs in the future, not just one, but many in the future, how do we continue to, to set priorities? How do we do the work over a continuum um, that is just part of the, the yearly uh, process. How do we assess? How do we look at long-term visioning and put that into action? So I absolutely think that could be a good process. I would love to explore that more uh, also because there's times where we can fall into the same group of people doing the same thing. And so how do we get the right people to then reach out to get more involved? And I think that's going to be the key piece that I'd ask of all of us. Um, who, who do we need to get involved with us? Uh, how do we how do we start to get the know and get the feedback going in? Because we can put out surveying work, we can put out uh, town halls and invite people in, but are we really connecting enough? So absolutely yes. And I think as we start to drive that that forward of next steps, uh, really from now all spring uh, will be a key piece of of how we do that. 
and that's that's part of the reason why we introduced uh, Nate Jones back there is I think as he's here listening, uh, he's gonna help organize not only board work, but community work, uh, committees work and, and staff work. Um, sorry, okay, just a couple comments. Um, when it comes to the mill, I love everything. So first I wanna say that, thanks for all the work you guys have done. Um, my concern would be if we try to do everything, um, the impact will be minimal. And I really wanna make sure that we're making sure our staff um, is, is feeling like we're supporting them and that um, we're doing everything we can to attract and retain high quality employees. So I just, um, that's just a comment from there. I think everything looks great, but I'm just concerned if we try to do everything that we'll be um, stretching ourselves very thin and it won't be impactful in the end. Um, and then when it comes to the bond, um, it was really helpful to see where we need the neighborhood schools. So thank you for that. But um, we definitely need to build some neighborhood schools. Um, we haven't done that, I think, since what, 2010? Yeah, so um, I'm totally in support and I'm willing to get the word out any way I can and what you said, um, Deputy Superintendent Abner, just I'm willing to help any way I can to be out speaking, whatever we need to do. Obviously it would be helpful to have some dollar amounts so that we can, you know. <laughs> Great, um, first names are okay, work session? Yeah. Okay, just wanted to make sure, so. Um, I have way too many thoughts to share, but let me let me start at the top. Um, first, Mr. Co or Rich loved the data points, and I think that's what we need, right? That's what we need in order to educate the community. And so, I really appreciated hearing those data pieces um, because I think I totally am in agreement with all of the needs that were mentioned. But the only way we can engage our community is to really educate them. You know, what is the wait list number? What percentage of autistic students are taking CTE courses? The TACT program, you know, would help in that area. And so I, I think getting all of those data points in line are really, really critical if we are to do an engagement process. So those were just a few of those thoughts. Um, I won't read all of my comments, I promise. Um, master capital plan. Do all the board members have a hard copy of the master capital plan? So please bring it to the next board meeting because we'll, we'll be meeting with some long range planning members. And I think it's really helpful to look at the map and kind of understand stuff. Um, so just a shout out for that. And um, for engagement purposes, I am a huge technology nerd, so I love online simulation tools. And you can program an online simulation tool to show you various scenarios. And it's open to the public and you can let people weigh in. Like, I wanna restore and it tells you at what cost. Or I want to add this feature and this is what the cost is. And I've been around the district for a long time and you know, when we were year round schools, we did a survey. Do you wanna get rid of year round schools? And people said yes, but we didn't ask them, like at what cost are you willing to pay? And so that's why I love the online simulation tools and um, they're not hard to, to build. I built them when we were doing budget cuts and used it on my own to try to engage people. So I just really wanna throw that out there. Okay, so next, uh, your question around board committees. Um, I think that's a great idea for the board to discuss. Those are board committees and we delegate to them. And so I think that makes a lot of sense, but it kind of gets us to who owns this outreach process with the community when we're talking about what we offer, who we're serving, and at what cost. And so I really believe, I very much appreciate all of this and I think the outreach is the right thing to do. I just think that's probably in the board's lane when we're talking about that. And we need to be front and center in helping to develop that. So I actually developed a 12 page plan um, <laughs> and I made copies for the board. And I think Corey made some copies because I gave him a copy 
as we were coming in. And I just want to hand this out for people to contemplate and we can think about it as we go into the next engagement opportunity. But the plan kind of walks you through all of the steps of an ownership plan where the difference between owners and customers and stakeholders and what that engagement process looks a little different based on whether you're engaging customers or you're engaging owners. And this is engaging owners. And I think it is the right work for us to be doing right now. Um, so anyway, those are my initial thoughts on the presentation and happy to pass it over to the next person. I guess a couple things. I want to um, piggyback on what Christy was saying in terms of prioritizing and also what Susan was saying in terms of we can take this out to the public and there's not going to be anybody that says, I don't want this. <laughs> and so figuring out how to maximize our leverage to really focus, I think is important. So I guess one of my first questions is where is the strategic plan interlaced through here? Because from a systemic thinker that I am, you know, we, we go back and look at that because that's prioritized those five or six themes that we've said from our community perspective, our staff perspective, these are the things that are the most important. And so I feel like that that should really drive then these kind of priorities. Um, there's not one thing on this list that I couldn't stand on a soapbox right now and say, absolutely, it's a need. My fear is if we take this out to the community, they prioritize, um, they give us feedback. There's always that notion of, well, you didn't think my certain item was as important or as valued. So, so that's where I would really encourage us to really interlace this with the strategic plan, our board goals, because I just think it's going to give us more leverage to give us the rationale for why we have identified these needs, because they are, they, are, they are all incredible needs that we've had for years and years. I mean, this is, um, in many ways, these aren't surprises um, that we need these things, <laughs> that these are needs. Um, so that would be one thing that I, I'm wondering about is how do we get more intentional in just as opposed to saying we've identified areas for growth that we can actually tie it back into saying here's a theme, equitable distribution of resources we need desperately to make sure that there's access and opportunity for all kids for these programs. So then we go after that as far as our focus and then our quest to get community engagement. The other thought I have said is just around special education. Um, is getting clear about our vision of continuum of services. Because I think sometimes we do special education um, from a reaction kind of notion. It's like, like you said, I've got these in-betweeners and I don't know quite how to meet their needs. Or I have these outliers and I'm not quite sure where they fit within the programming. And I think what's not necessarily been clear for me in the hundred of years that I've been in this district is what is our vision? When we look at inclusionary practices versus you know, focus programming. We look at center-based programming versus um, um, integrating that within neighborhood schools. And so I think vision's really important in that area because I think what I, I get a little overwhelmed when I look at the special education because it feels like we're, we're putting a lot of plugs in holes right now as opposed to saying our vision is this. This is our continuum of services and this is where we need to make sure we fill in the gaps with. So that's just one mm -hmm. thing that I'm contemplating is how do we make that more clear so that we do go out to special education? Like for instance, the K through eight special needs school for affective needs, that really got a bad rap uh, 10 or 15 years ago because it looked like we were going opposite of least restrictive environment. We were saying, okay, we're gonna get the post office, the old post office building in Parker, and we're gonna put all these kids in there that we don't know what to do with. And it really got a bad rap because we weren't clear with what is the vision for that kind of programming? Because we don't want to go backwards and start saying, okay, now we're going to just a cluster group kids that have similar needs under a roof 
because that would go, that would be a uh, direct conflict in terms of what we believe is best practices when it comes to inclusionary practices for all kids. So, so I feel like that, that area needs, at least for me, some clarity about, um, about vision. And I guess that's the thing that I would keep going back to is, is I think as a board, we're the trustees of the vision. And so I think it would really help us to get really clear so it doesn't look like we're just doing some hodgepodge kind of um, needs assessment that we're truly saying, this has been our vision. Here's our goals, here's our strategic plan, and here's the rationale for why we're coming out to you community to say, we believe this is a, a, an area of growth based on our strategic plan that's driving this. This is an area of growth that we need to focus on. So those are just some initial thoughts I have. So I see maybe a similar thought process that, that this actually leads really well into the next topic also. Um, I agree with you. I think some of the costing uh, is a next step. When we think about this study session and the three topics we have, you only have so much time. So we're going to have to build this out. The alignment with strategic plan is very much in our next steps. Uh, as we start to create our vision and our priorities, uh, what we want to make sure of, and, and hearing the piece of, of we really do value the compensation, uh, we need to take care of our employees. Uh, as you hear a little bit of our prioritization in all areas, we have needs in all areas. How do we set priorities? How do we start to look at that as cost and value and vision towards that piece um, will definitely be our next steps. And I actually think it is a great discussion uh, with board about where are we on top of board with myself and staff, where are we? And then as we start to also get the validation of our community, uh, what we feel represents, but are we correct? And we get more feedback in. And then uh, the last piece is, anytime you think about needs of a system this large, um, there are a lot of needs. So therefore, the cost we're going to have to prioritize. Uh, similar, I don't know that we can ask for everything because you look at the impact of cost. So how do you lay this out over a stepped out time frame? Uh, what do you do first? What do you do second? How, if you get money coming in, how can we separate it to, to, to use other money to hit priorities? Um, same with, as we heard with uh, Rich Cosgrove talking about, if we have an emergency that comes up, you have to shift a priority. Uh, but we still need to get other things done on a timely basis. So I think everything you said, David, uh, Christy, Susan, um, I think it fits naturally of our progression moving forward. Um, love the fact that we are exploring and we need to dig deeper. And uh, in this exploration, we start to evaluate and start giving you more information and data on top of the entire system and community. So, so love it. Uh, Susan, I saw you wanted to talk a little bit. You want to pass the mic or? Maybe one, more. one more thing. Perfect. <laughs> um, so I just want to go back to why I think the, the simulation tool is like a great tool to use is because of the context and the information. And I think you have community members that are going to say, well, you just passed an MLL bond, right? You just did this you can have that information built into it where you say, this is where the dollars went. You know, it gives concrete information. And I get really worried around elections because people, there's two ways to influence people according to Simon Sinek. You can manipulate them or you can inform them or inspire them. And informing takes longer and it's a lot more work, but it builds trust over a long term. Um, unfortunately, during elections, a lot of times people only care about passing an election and they just don't give all the information sometimes. And so I think investing in educating our community around dollars, needs, where money has gone, how much it takes to restore, I think that will build the trust that's needed to move the community to understanding and to give and equip people answers to respond to concerns that other people hear. So anyway, I will stop with that. Thank you. Any other questions or feedback uh, before we kind of naturally transition to the next Yeah, topic? I was wondering if we need a 10 minute break for folks. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, okay. so uh, 35, let's come back at 45.
Uh, item number five, the parent and family engagement in DTSD. So it is my pleasure this evening to lead this conversation, and this will truly be a conversation. So um, my voice in this will probably be less than five minutes, but I just want to kind of set the stage a bit in terms of this really essentially important topic around parent and family engagement in Douglas County School District. And this is grounded in the board ends. Uh, statement that you are all very well aware of. And so I am not going to highlight any of those critical points because you know them uh, well, um, but this is definitely connected to not only our board ends, but also our Douglas County School District parent and family engagement policy, which you've had an opportunity also to review prior um, to this conversation. And when we talk about parent and family engagement, in Douglas County School District, it looks like and sounds like and is, lives and breathes in many different manners in our district, from the engagement that happens at the school level to the engagement that happens at the district level, and that partnership is is essentially important as we support um, our students and their academic set success as they journey through our, um, our organization. And so, you may recall back in August, I outlined at a pretty high level some of our intentions around parent and family district engagement opportunities. So I'm really gonna highlight district here because engagement happens in many different respects at the school level as well. So this is uh, very much just a high level overview and some highlights of our district engagement opportunities thus far this year. Those ongoing opportunities uh, that we provide for our parents, our families, and community members um, through special education, our gifted education, English language development, parent universities, and town hall. And you have heard from many of the leaders of these different apart, um, departments around what that engagement looks like over the course of the last couple of months. You may recall that we highlighted our uh, family cultural liaisons just a couple months ago, um, and that was just a, a perfect example of some of the work that we're doing at the district level in regards to engaging um, with our community, and that's connected in some respects to English language development as an example. So those are those ongoing opportunities that happen uh, for our parents and our families. Some semester one highlights as well, as you may recall, um, we started back in August um, with our back to school um, overview that Superintendent Wise led around our COVID protocols at the time, transportation, resources for students, et cetera. Then that was followed by an engagement opportunity uh, in October, or actually September, around safety, security, and social emotional supports for students. We had the panel uh, discussion, and when I say engagement, we really asked our community what they wanted to hear more about relative to those um, practices in our district, and we customized that panel conversation around that feedback that we received um, from the feedback form. Uh, we also, uh, in October, engaged around our elementary core reading programs, and there is more to come on this particular topic topic in the coming uh, weeks, but we provided opportunities for our parents and our families to learn more about the resources that we are exploring and considering for implementation moving forward around our elementary core reading. So there were engagement opportunities um, offered for our families in that respect. And then around educational equity and inclusive excellence, we really took the first um, semester to work with our um, equity advisory council planning team to develop the Equity Advisory Council, which is in our policy. And we had our first meeting in December. Our second meeting is actually tomorrow evening. And really the intention of that meeting is to um, elect the officers of the Equity Advisory Council. We really, 
get, we, we slowed down and we took some really concentrated time to do that process and do it well. And we engaged with our community in that respect and had hundreds of applicants uh, for membership apply to be a part of our equity advisory council. So that is uh, just um, in its emerging state as of this point. Um, in terms of semester two highlights, those things that are on the radar, or tentative plans, is we do have our Douglas County School District Sources of Strength Community Night. That is on January 24th, and that is at the Pace Center in Parker. Um, we have DAC Forum that is also scheduled for February 17th with the focus on mental health resources and supports. It's kind of an additional extension to our panel conversation that happened. Um, in first semester. And then, of course, we just had the overview of Douglas County School District now and in the future. We just had a little bit of conversation about what engagement um, may look like in regards to that topic. One of the things I would just also want to let you know that when we offer these different district opportunities for our parent um, community um, and our families, we also reflect on what worked really well and what might we need to improve moving forward um, because there's an opportunity for growth um, in with any of these different experiences that we've had, which really lends us, um, well, before we go there, I also wanted to highlight an overview of what Mr. Sid Rundle has uh, led in terms of um, our student support services and the special education engagement opportunities specifically. And Sid, I'm not sure if you'd like to just highlight any of those or impress upon this group some of that work this first semester. Well, I, I guess I do. I would love to jump in here and just celebrate in particularly the Douglas County Special Education Advisory Committee or DCCAC. What a tremendous, uh, wonderful group of, of parents and community members. It, they just seem so energized, so uh, committed, so dedicated. And I, I'm especially delighted because they, they, they courageously asked at the beginning of this year, and I so appreciate that, Sid, we want action items. We want real work. We don't want to find ourselves identifying the problem ad nauseum. We want, we want to dig in and really get to work. And that is exactly what, what they have followed through on. So the, the DCC Act parents and the, the directors of uh, special education and mental health have formed small little task force work groups. And we are making some actual um, progress in some really important high level things like discipline and, and students with disabilities. Uh, what's the role of school resource officers with some of our population? We're talking some really important conversations. And this is a community partnership that's happening with DCC Act. So just a shout out to those parents in that community because it's a true model of what I think parent engagement uh, should look like. As you said, I think we learned something. I think our community workshop on dyslexia, we, we did too much of the talking and we didn't engage enough. So we, we learned from our, our experience there. We're gonna do a better job with uh, the presentation of, of information and be less didactic and a little more um, interactive. Thank you, Sid. And so really this, um, this part of our evening agenda is really intended to be a discussion because we want to hear from our Board of Education directors in terms of this conversation about engagement. And so there are a few framing questions, but by no means do we have to go through each question and, and discuss them as a group. But Hopefully these questions kind of give some frame in terms of, of what we would love to hear from our Board of Education Directors. What do you think of or how do you define parent and family engagement? And some of that was already expressed in our earlier conversation. What's working? and what might we continue to enhance? So what are those positive things that you may be hearing from in terms of our communities and how can we enhance those things? How might we increase the effectiveness of our parent and family engagement efforts? And what opportunities do we have for growth moving forward in terms of our focus areas, in terms of format, communication, when our Board of Education directors take the lead, when in staff, um, and when staff take the lead. So would love to just open this up for conversation. Superintendent Wise, is there anything else you would like to add?
So to launch this, I think a few of the things. If there's topics you'd like to have, if there's specific areas, uh, you know, we already we already kind of started talking a little bit about how do we engage. Uh, what's the roles? Who's our ownership? So I don't know if we want to start there, if you want to go through questions. But again, uh, really, we want to to listen to your feedback. Um, we look at who we are and where we're going next and how we, you know, times are complicated. So how we work with a large uh, district, a community, and, and start to assess priorities together and move it forward. Uh, we want to listen and let you open the floor to you. We've done a lot of the talking to try to share a little bit of priorities and really want to open it up. So just to start with the first question of how would you define parent and family engagement, um, I think everybody can agree that it's really just finding a way for, for families to feel like they have an opportunity to provide input and that it is heard. Um, I think where the definition of engagement gets tricky is that I, I think many people, it's just human nature, feel like um, unless there was a reaction or or something, a, a policy changed, or um, when they bring a concern to your attention, um, that concern was resolved exactly as they had hoped it would be. I, I think that um, making people feel heard when you can't always say yes is a challenge. Um, I, I think the other part of engagement beyond just input and, and valuing that input is I think conversations need to be reciprocal. I, I think that the district needs to have a meaningful way to share information and be heard, have that information actually be consumed, um, and there has to be a balance of information, of give and take. Um, when there's an information void, again, it's just human nature to fill it. <laughs> and um, especially with the challenges of social media right now, if there's not complete information available in a way that is resonating with our community, it's going to be filled and more than likely it's not going to be with accurate information. So um, I think my, my easy definition of parent engagement is finding a way for our families to pr have input, feel heard. Um, tricky part is how that works when a um, situation may not be resolved exactly how they, they had hoped. And um, a critical piece for me is that reciprocal element. Sure, I'll go. Um, and I, I wanted just sticking to the first question so we don't get off track. Um, I wanted to echo some of the things that uh, Director Hansen just said. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, one of the things I found difficult is a lot of the one way um, communications, uh, I agree, without an engagement. So what is engagement? I think we have to not only accept the, the push, things that people are pushing to us, because they tend to be very polarized, very loud voices on one side and very loud voices on the other side. And sometimes we don't get a good sense for what the middle is. So I think there has to be a pull as well. And echoing back to the previous presentation, I think going out and actively asking for feedback on things rather than just waiting for the polarized feedback on, on extreme sides of an issue, whatever the issue is, um, needs to come back. One of the things I'd, I'll put out here right now for those listening, I'll give you an example of one. Um, we spoke earlier, I spoke earlier about how do we deal with educational equity. Um, I'm the liaison, one of two, along with Director Meek, uh, to the Equi uh, Equity Advisory Council, and they just had their first meeting right before the break. This next meeting, as was mentioned, is just going to be to elect officers. Um, people I know, I see it on social media, are freaking out. Uh, you know, is, is the new board coming in to cancel equity? No, we're not. In fact, just to give a preview for what we're going to ask is we're going to ask to have a resolution that just reaffirms that parents uh, are primary in beliefs and values for their kids and that we could have a better understanding of equity and the ask uh, in the next meeting will be for more input from the community, from a broader input to have the, the superintendent work with the Equity Advisory Council to come back to the board with more voices, with more advice on how we can ensure implementation um, meets intent. So that would be one example of, I think, um, we are listening and we do want to get more voices in a conversation and we do want to get a more of a pull in. My Elizabeth. Um, <laughs> engagement to me, if you use the word engagement, it has to be two-way. 
right? And I think that's what I'm hearing people say. And it's really important to think about that when you're designing opportunities that you're calling engagement. Um, I think the other thing um, I would weigh in on with parent engagement here, defining it is the question, are students part of it because it's family or are we only talking about parent? Just when it says parent and family engagement, I just wonder, are students part of that or not? Because I didn't see student reflected throughout. And we also didn't include staff specifically in this particular conversation, not for no reason like yeah. absolute, but we were focusing in on the parent being. Yeah, so it was the definition piece. And, and with family, I just wasn't sure if that included student, but it doesn't for this definition. Um, and I, I do want to say I have thoroughly appreciated the engagement that I have seen over you know, this school year. Um, I've been to the special education listening opportunities and various opportunities, and I'm very, very impressed with, with all of that, and that's, that's great. Um, you know, I think, and I, I didn't mean to freak people out by handing out this plan and <laughs> everything, um, but I just started thinking about what what our role is and what the superintendent's role is. And, and when you're looking at policy governance as your operating system, um, it's defined in a way where the, the superintendent is garnering engagement with, with the customers, the parents and families. And the, the superintendent is working really closely with those individuals. And oftentimes when you are talking about parents and engagement, they're talking about their child's needs, right? And that's what they're advocating for. They're not there to advocate for overall services and how they should be delivered. And so that's kind of the difference between those engagement opportunities. So I thought it might be helpful to just clarify that a little bit. Um, but with these engagement opportunities that we're talking about, I guess I just wonder how we track the feedback that's coming in so that, and I think Danelle was kind of alluding to that earlier, maybe. And I think um, being able to track the input and making sure that we're following up with individuals and they're hearing back that this is, we heard you, here are the things that we're gonna maybe do differently or we're gonna look into or here are the next steps. So I think those would be the other areas that kind of come to mind. This isn't way off what I'm thinking, but, and I can see it from a parent view because I had kids in Douglas County. I can see it as a teacher view. And one of the things, and I, as many of you know, I went back into teaching at an, oh, a later age. Um, I needed a little help with some classroom management things going on because when you have 16 years out of the classroom. And what I'm wondering is, at the time, we had BRTs, correct? We had the BRTs, which was really a great resource. What? Well, the well, it was the building resource teacher, but is there a new name for it now? Okay. Teacher coach. So um, one of the things that, and I saw many young kids, and I'm going to attribute this to my age, and when I went in, I wanted to listen because I definitely wanted a better classroom. So uh, just engaging teachers to have that communication with parents. That, to me, is a big, big step. Getting teachers to understand how to communicate. And I think it goes both ways. I think there's some parents that just struggle with wanting to communicate with a teacher. And, the, and so they might say, you know, my voice isn't getting heard or something like that. And it's the same way with teachers with a student and teaching teachers to reach out and work with parents and talk to them and understand that, yes, you do have a voice, even though you might have, as middle school, 150 kids per semester. And that's difficult. But there, it all begins with communication. 
and then and it begin, then it starts with the t in there then it's the school then it's the principal then it's it's the the BRT and I know I keep getting that acronym wrong with the what they're called now but that's just teaching 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 without putting something else on a teacher's plate but just because then once you get that going everything is a little bit smoother for teachers and the communication process. And once I believe people know that you're willing between the principal, the teachers, and the parents, and I particularly, because I was a hands-on type of class, an elective class, I've, I've said before, to have parents come into my classroom that helped. And even in middle school, I mean, that's popular in elementary. And I, and I wanted to ask that question. Was there a point with during COVID that we had backed off anyway? I mean, we were totally shut down. But now are we allowing, do we have more parents can now come back into the classroom and be openly invited? And and I'm hoping with, I hope there are some things that we did learn through COVID. One of them is I hope we learned to slow down. Because I think in the busyness of life, we trusted, always trusted our education system and um, to do things our teachers and and so but we still needed that parent engagement so um, I'm excited Stacy and I have been talking and I know I agreed to be the liaison for um, parent and family engagement so I'm excited to get started she and I talked and we're gonna meet here pretty soon so anyway um, but I guess feed my opinion, too, along with Elizabeth and Susan, is that it it has to be a conversation, right? It, it cannot feel like you're being told. Um, I don't feel like that ever feels good for anybody. Um, but, for instance, if we were to have, like when you did this, the special education, I'm just using that as an example, not because it was anything but wonderful, but... Um, I, to do a panel is is great. I think that's awesome. I just think maybe making sure that in the end we leave a lot more time for discussion instead of having people come and then just feel like they're being told how things are, are working. Um, sometimes people have why questions that they just need to have answered. And even like Elizabeth, you said, you know, if it's not answered the way you want it to be answered, at least you feel like you're being engaged and um, understood. So. Yeah, one thing I would recommend on that, and I, I picked up on what Sid said, we, we've asked, what, what can we do better? And I think maybe even building in an explicit feedback loop after, immediately after any session. So if we have an hour engagement, hey, do the hour, make it interactive, but also say, look, for those that wish to stay, the engagement part's over, now we're doing debrief. What worked well for this engagement? What did not work well? What should we, should we continue to do? What should we do differently in the next engagement? And let people, when it's fresh in their minds, um, provide that immediate feedback to staff so we can take notes and then implement those things. I think building in that, that deliberate little mini, doesn't have to be long, five minutes, liberal, uh, little deliberate mini debrief right when the thing is done, even for our larger things, um, may be good is an immediate way to get feedback from the community. I was going to add that I, I think we have some really good models of how we did that. You know, I, I was thinking at your school, Sid, a year ago, we had the seminar where we did the dyslexia uh, simulations and we, we were in small groups and we had conversation. And, and I think that's to me what maybe Christy, you're getting at too, is that as opposed to a round table panel that gives information, it just, if we can give topical conversations that people actually engage in, in small groups, that's what I, that's my vision of round table conversation. It's not the panel and then we ask questions, it's that we actually have a topic to discuss amongst us. And, and I think that's what's gonna really bring meaning to a lot of the things that we're trying to do is to let people converse about it first and hear from each other's perspectives. And, and then maybe we hear from the panel of experts and maybe then we kind of wrap that up uh, with, with some more content. But I, I think that round table discussion uh, would really pull people in because I think Mike, you were asking the question, how do we, how do we pull people in more to, to have those uh, engagement sessions? The other thing that I think to me seems important is what I would call role definition. Um, how do we define the role of the parent 
and how do we define the role of an educator? Because uh, I think what happens sometimes when we when we blur those lines is that um, we get into the uh, the diff the more difficult conversations. I mean, a parent brings to the table that perspective of the child. I know my child. I, I know what I want for my child. I know either what's working well for my child or what's not. The educator has the pedagogy to say, you know, this is the this, this is how I will help your child grow. This is how I will help your child become better. Um, and I think sometimes where our engagement discussions get blurred is when our parent maybe says to the teacher, this is how I want you to do your job, and vice versa, where the teacher says, parent, this is how you do your job. So I think part of the engagement process is really clearly defining how do we make that partnership happen? Because I, when I think of engagement, I think more of a partnership. We each bring some unique perspective, unique expertise, but we don't necessarily bring the I know it all and I can tell you how to do your job or you can tell me how to do my job. So I think that would be really helpful, I think, from the front end is to say, what is, what is the purpose of parent engagement? Um, and, and to get clear, too, about things like um, advocacy versus influencing the system. I, I can come in as a parent and advocate for my child's needs. I don't always have the opportunity, though, to tell the system how to do its work. You know, so I, I think there's a lot of conversation that could take down some notches of some of the conflict if we respect each other and respect each other's um, a role. So I would really advocate that that be part of that definition of engagement is what is what is your role, you know? And and, and, I, and I think even the old fashioned Venn diagram where you you know you have the parent Venn and you've got the uh, the the educator Venn and then you've got some things that are in common where the two concentric circles come together. But I think it's just helpful for us to have that on the front end so that we don't have assumptions that maybe are incorrect. So, so those are the things I think about when I think about engagement. This is maybe a little bit of an old guy comment, um, but I'll, I'll take the privilege of doing so. The fact that we have even a thing called parent or community engagement is in and of itself an implicit indictment because it presents two opposing parties that need to come together to engage. We're, we're in a very unique time. We're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a time, unfortunately, where civil discourse, the ability, Becky, to your point, the ability to just have good old fashioned conversations, to, 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 to agree to disagree, to disagree civilly, to, to, but, to, but to speak truth and to listen and hear one another, that, that ultimately is, is, is what schools were designed to do. The schools weren't designed to serve the community. The schools were a part of the community. The schools were the community. And you didn't need to engage. You were. We're a long ways from there. And uh, we, we have a distinguished member in our, our audience over there, Mr. Colley, who could certainly speak very clear to this glaring need for sometimes it's just human conversation and the need for what I would consider very, very much a lost art. Um, and it's lost in the political stratification and, and divergence of our, of our culture wars. It's lost in uh, a, a younger generation that, that uh, has, has not had the benefit of seeing it modeled well for them. Uh, and, and then technology has, has uh, sabotaged that. Social media has influenced that for, for a whole lot of constellations that we're all familiar with. The one thing that is most necessary and most needed in education right now is just the, reg the, the, the restoration of humanity, human interactions. C courtesy and, and, and courage to speak human to human about kids that we are mutually committed to serving and taking care of. And it's my belief we will never really have good community engagement and communication until we can find our way back to that place. So that's my old guy speech. Here, that's, here, that's, here. I was just going to say that's a pretty good old guy speech. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, Sid, it's the why. Why do we have community engagement, right? So the why is because our public schools can only be as strong as they can be if, if our community cares and they want to engage and we want to work together. And so, 
you know, I've been thinking about this topic a lot today. I ran into a parent earlier this morning when I was walking the dog and I was talking with them about engagement and, well, actually, they were talking about COVID numbers at the school and, you know, different things. And I said, well, have you shared, you know, your perspective? And she said, you know, I, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved because I just feel like there's extremes. And I think, and, and it just makes me really sad because you have parents who are not engaging with their school to try to be productive in talking about things because they're worried they're going to get classified as this type of person or that type of person and their spouse has a business and they're worried about this and they're and how do you have strong public schools if we cannot work together and have dialogue together and so our system doesn't work if we're not able to have authentic engagement. Like we set up committees, right? We set up board committees, we set up SACs, we set up all of these committees to get engagement, but we have individuals that don't want to engage. And it's because of the politicization of everything right now. And I'm very fearful if we can't get past that, so. I think that's a good segue into the next question of what's what's working and what could we continue to enhance. Um, my notes, as the four new board members start to see more emails and um, more, just more feedback, I think you'll realize quickly that our building leaders are extraordinary and have, every single one of them have a special skill to build trusting, meaningful relationships with their families. And so I think what's working well is within our small organizations, within those small groups of buildings, engagement's working very well. And there are very few problems that our building leaders cannot solve through the relationships that they have invested in and built. Um, I think where we as a system start to break down is when a um, when that engagement or when when a situation escalates to that next level and it leaves the building. I don't know that we have the same level of relationships established and I, I think that that could be something that we could continue to enhance. Um, just simply what happens when when engagement elevates beyond those building relationships. so many opportunities that we have in any given day where we do interact and engage and, and try very hard to work in partnership with our families in regards to supporting the needs of students. And oftentimes we don't have an opportunity to share all of those successes either. Um, most typically, you know, we do get highlighted when we misstep or when things are not agreeable. But I would say in any given day, as I look around the table, many of us are engaged for a, a portion of our day around engagement with families or staff, et cetera, to help to support. Um, and so I think there's opportunity um, there as well and a need to continue to reflect and improve our practice. I just want to make sure I didn't, I don't think that anyone is, could be doing anything differently to engage. It is virtually impossible for Corey to have the same relationship with every single member of our community as it is for an elementary school principal. So it's, it's not necessarily something that our staff need to be doing differently. It's a, it's a barrier that we have just built into the, the simple size of what we're, what we're up against. Yeah, you know, one thing I'll add to what I think we're doing well or what specifically the superintendent supported by his cabinet's doing well, uh, we get a weekly, and this is for folks listening, we get a weekly leadership update of kind of what's transpired, what's going on, and big picture stuff. And I think 
it's very helpful to me as a board member because all the board members get that. And so when we reference what's going on and it's coming from the superintendent and his staff and it's very contemporary, this is what happened this week, these are the challenges we're facing, this is what we're dealing with it, then it allows us to align uh, and just echo that message out to people that we're being engaged with and it makes sure that what is being said by one director and another director is all reflecting um, what our superintendent and our executive and his staff are doing. So I found those summaries to be incredibly useful and I found them to be very effective at keeping us all on the page and on a common message. So um, a, a great best practice that we need to continue. Danielle, before you jump in, um, or I mean, please go ahead and jump in. Please. I would just think I was I was thinking about what Elizabeth was saying in terms of when a concern from a parent goes beyond whether it's to our executive directors of schools, you know, and, and that navigating that system in terms of how do I get resolution to a concern I have, you know, for for years now, you know, we have really tried to formalize a system. You know, really putting a system in place that says, you know, here's your first step. If, if, if you are still feeling unresolved and you've talked to the principal, who do you talk to next? And, and really a system that really documents along the way how a concern has progressed through that. And so I'm just wondering, you know, as we're, as we're asking the question, what can we do better? I don't know where we are with that. I mean, I, I know that's been something that two years ago. We, we launched and we've come back to, and then there was some piloting of that. And then, so, so I would love to know for our community's sake, you know, how do they navigate the system? But I also agree with you, Danielle, that there are many success stories where our EDOS intervene and are able to resolve at that level that we have no idea ha have been resolved. And, and, and I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, I just think we also need to get clear about what that what that process looks like. So um, previous leadership kind of led through that particular process and, uh, and it was mentioned at public comment, um, I believe in December, where is that process living now, right? And so um, we, have, we, have, we have that process and we have a responsibility to look at it at current state, make any additional refinements, obviously with any board feedback and get it um, active within the organization. But my recollection, and granted I was not directly involved in that at the time, was that timing, like anything else that happened in March of 2020, kind of derailed many of the things that were going on at that point and then paused it. And we have a responsibility to bring it back forth and say, where are we at with it? And then our student advisory group, and I'm meeting with one of those, with one of the student representatives this week, also has been actively wanting to participate in processes that have some alignment with that. And so we're in those conversations right now as well. Yeah, just, just quickly anecdotally, as a, as a new director, um, we get a lot of emails from folks, my child, this instance, dear director, sometimes not even to the full group of directors. Um, and I have found that when we go back to KE and just say, look, we, we have a board policy, public complaint, KE, and it's designed to work at the local level, starting with the teacher or staff member, then the administrator, the principal, then the EDOS, and we kind of just educate them and say, have you started here? They were a lot of what I'm seeing as a new director is where's that policy? I was unaware. And anything we can do, I know that we, we have the, the big list of policies, right? And it's kind of, if you know it's in there, you know it's in there. But if there's something we can do to almost separate that and make it easier, um, because when we say, you know, director, people are like, well, who's the director? We're like, oh, your regional boss of your principal. Oh, okay. Even to the point where we could flow chart it for somebody that says, look, I'm in this feeder. Here's my, obviously my principal. This is the one of the four EDOSs I go to. And, and here is almost a visual map. 
Um, once I found that we direct people to that, it generally works out very well. They just did not know where to start. Yep, and so, so a couple things. One, I think that that process side, have you started with the direct source? Go directly to the person, see if you can solve it in a piece. When it becomes formal, uh, where it got to uh, last within the, the KE or the process side is what's reasonable amount of time? So in the stall out is how much time and how do we decide to do this well and what's reasonable mean? So I think we as a system need to come back to really define that. Um, then I think you have to implement. Sometimes you can try to be perfect and in everything we've said is there's versions and you're always going to improve that version. So how do we put that in place, put it in action and see how well it's working? And I think that's the next step of it. We have everything, but rather than worry and try to have all of us agree on what's reasonable amount of time, we need to set those parameters in place and you adjust. I think in anything in this process, you have to work through, you document, you see through, you try to find resolution. We always try to find win-win. It does get complicated at times when a resolution isn't to the satisfaction of, of an individual. But we also have to say, what does that look like? And then what are next steps and when does it close? But I think that, that timing piece is where we, we had dialogue. And I think that's where uh, with former staff uh, was a bit of that. Uh, we need, we, need to have, we need to have finalization and, and implement. So we are, and it's there, but we, we can define that out uh, in next steps. But I also would agree with some of the things we've heard. Um, too often at times, uh, we can pick apart the negative. So I also think we need to continue to say, what are we doing well? And, and it goes into, um, we, when things are going well, communication seems pretty easy. When there's challenge or conflict, how do you work through that well? Uh, so I think, uh, you know, how we build systems to work through conflict, what is healthy conflict, uh, what are crucial conversations, what is resolution and parameters, uh, what's a short-term and long-term measurement of that over time, uh, because typically there's not one, one, one problem or conflict or concern that doesn't continue to be measured and find growth over time. So I think on each of those uh, to go into and we look at it, um, again, we get into when, the great part is in education, we work with people. But I also would say uh, with the number of people and you create systems, uh, that creates a dynamics and people might change. Uh, s uh, schools change and, and each year you have that cycle piece which allows us to start over. But then you're moving to a different grade and you work with different people and where is that, that, that issue then? So I think you have to look at is it a person piece? Is it a systems piece and how do we resolve? And then at the same time, uh, what's going well? And I appreciate what you said about, about schools resolving. Because uh, I do feel when you get to the relational side, you get to the closest at home, what, what can that look like? So um, great, great feedback on a little bit of what's working well and what can we improve. I don't know if we, in time-wise, we also want to get into how do we increase the effectiveness? How do we measure uh, what's effective, what's not? How do we get, the one question I have, uh, we try to create lots of opportunities, but sometimes participation. Um, we're busy getting, we try to create an event with lots of people to hopefully encourage a lot of people to be a part of, and also have multiple uh, perspectives be a part of. How do we get more involvement? How can we as a group and also get others to, to really get better involvement to engage, uh, to build perspective, especially when we talk about the needs of a, a district 64,000 students? Um, you know, think about the number of families and then those who don't have students in it. So just ideas about how we can be more effective too. I think that recognizing just hosting a sheer, just counting a number of um, events that we host where people have the opportunity to engage doesn't necessarily equate to a strong <laughs> engagement process. Um, I tried to think back through my own personal experiences, talked with a few people. I genuinely think that most families in our district become the most involved with their students, with the school district during their elementary years. I don't know if it's simply because it's a smaller school, if it is um, just the nature of the people in those schools. I don't know what it is, but um, 
I think very consistently our elementary years are where we have strong parent engagement. And I think taking the um, opportunity that has already been presented to try and incorporate some of the, the district-wide engagement um, needs that we have at that elementary level could be an opportunity that we haven't completely capitalized on in the past. Um, and the, the flip side to that is I recognize our administrators plates are overflowing. I mean, I know you guys are covering recess duty right now and subbing and I don't, I feel like this is kind of a, a cautionary potential downward spiral. We need our, administra our administrators to have FaceTime and build relationships with our community but you guys don't have time to do that. And that requires additional people and additional funding. And without that element of trust and that strong relationship, it's really hard to increase funding. And so we're, we're kind of just stuck in a, in a cyclical uh, nature that isn't helpful, but um, short term problem solving. Um, I do think there's an some low hanging fruit with opportunities to really connect with our community through their already willingness to be a part of um, and, and completely invest in their elementary schools. And then that can hopefully carry through um, throughout their students' educational careers. So I made it, I, I know this may be totally unreasonable, but. Um, Talking to some parents, I think also, and like I said, this I understand there would be a lot of logistics to work around this, but perhaps offering um, other time opportunities, because I know sometimes, you know, there are parents that, you know, work full time, so they can't do daytimes, right? So we do a lot of this stuff in the evening, but on the flip side, you also have some parents that daytimes are going to be easier because either they work evenings or uh, they have kids in 50,000 different activities. And so they're trying to do carpool. So, and I know space will be an issue. I, I know that there's a lot of logistics, but just trying to throw out a different idea. Um, and that's probably way down the road when we're not dealing with what we're dealing with currently, but just kind of food for thought and something to think about. I wonder if we're maximizing and leveraging all of our network, right? So I don't know. I don't know if we include charter families in promoting, and I, that's a significant portion of our population. And so I'm not sure how they're included. Um, we didn't talk about them with, you know, parent family. We didn't call them out separately in this. Um, I also wonder about, you know, business groups, chamber groups, you know, Sometimes people have to hear stuff multiple times, and so if they get something through different networks, it might catch their attention. Um, and just other civic leaders and making and asking them to push out information through their networks. And so I don't know if we're already doing those things or not doing those things, but I just think leveraging every potential um, opportunity will really hopefully maximize our network that way. So with time, it kind of leads us into our last topic. Um, when we start talking about the last one about areas of focus, a clear piece of uh, engagement is around uh, where are we with our COVID protocols? Uh, we've returned for second semester. Uh, we are in week two. What, what's happening? Uh, what's working? Uh, what are those challenges? And what are next steps? So, so kind of, uh, if, we're, if we're good with that, um, transition into uh, last topic. Um, I'd like to I'd like to start off just with a few things. Um, you know, as I said, with transportation, and you look at the the individual stepping up and doing more. Uh, in this time, Douglas County School District is not any different than neighboring school districts across the metro area, across the state, and across the country. Um, everyone is stepping up and doing more. You hear all hands on deck. You hear, uh, we want to have in-person work with schools, and I'm gonna be very blunt and honest, uh, this isn't just about mass. 
Everyone's facing this regardless of mass. You look at our data compared to neighboring districts, it is very, very similar and trending very, very similar. Now we're gonna have to measure over time. We're gonna have to look at our system and evaluate is what is happening, what are our tipping points. You know, when I say thank you to the bus drivers, James right back there is at a uh, high school uh, picking up where we don't have all the security guards uh, personnel that we need. So we have people picking up the slack in other places. Uh, thank you to all of our substitutes. We've asked and, and we've had uh, absences. We have people who are positive with COVID, people that are just ill that can't be at work. And we have a number of substitutes responding within that. Uh, we have teachers covering for other teachers. We've had people cover for classified positions where we have central office and other people going over, central classified office going over and helping out the other. And we have a central office spreadsheet where we also are jumping out into schools to cover. But I want you to know in that process, as much as everyone is stretched, it's true across every district. As the Denver area superintendents come together, we are all talking about that. Uh, coming back, the positive rates with Omicron and spreading, but also today listening again to the CEO of, of Skyridge, uh, to having a rep from, from Littleton Porter, Little, uh, Littleton Hospital, uh, Venice, thank you, Littleton, Venice uh, uh, Hospital. Um, you know, there, there are issues also around staffing, but they're also able to get through. They are trying to not only work through COVID cases, but also having all the other pieces within, within the hospital. Uh, but they too have to look at staffing when they have number of employees, uh, not only nurses, doctors, but also people who are cleaning and doing those things within their, in their office. If they don't have it within their hospital, what does it work? So I think it's a tipping point of balance. Uh, but I want you to know as we start getting into a bit of our COVID protocols, what are we doing? As I turn it over to Sid and, and, and Matt Reynolds to talk more, um, this is common everywhere. But I'm also very proud to say that, that we, in the first week and now close to a week and a half, uh, have a very good plan. We're working hard. Uh, as we talk about air purifiers, we've added air purifiers to every single classroom. On top of across offices, transportation, we have four in this room. If you hear the little hum, we have four air purifiers within this room. Uh, they are very effective and purposeful air purifiers. They're high quality within that. Um, and we've used them in different places prior, but we're able to add those now and have them back. So kudos to O&M and delivery, uh, Zach, uh, going the extra uh, uh, within that side. So I'd like to, to you know, truly say a number of people thank you on top of all staff, subs, uh, teachers covering more, administrators covering more, uh, uh, central admin covering more, that it's a, it's a team effort. And it goes a long way. And there is no one perfect way to work through COVID. Period. If there was, everyone would be doing it. There are other districts similar to us, Academy 20, other districts all semester. We, I, I, elephant in the room, we have to be aware and address, but also say that we've worked with our students with ADA. We worked with our staff with ADA. We feel very proud of the work that schools with our teams of support uh, are putting in place. And, um, you know, I know there's difference of opinion everywhere but also in this room. So, you know, as we start talking about how we work together and have conversation, how we engage, um, you know, it's, it's my role as a staff to implement, but it's also how we bring out the best, even in difficult and challenging conversations, uh, in differences in opinions and conflict and how we have that healthy. And so I just really kind of want to open up that way, uh, a bit of a sharing of a little bit of detail and knowledge, we're gonna go on more, uh, but also as we look at it, uh, knowing that it's a polarizing topic. Um, it can be a divisive topic, but it also is one that I, I really feel moving uh, in, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, everything we want to do this semester is build it together. We're better together. And so how we start taking those differences, find in common, find purpose, we all have the same intent. Uh, we want what's best for each and every person, what's best for our students, best for our staff, our families, our community, uh, our our. our, our healthcare organizations. And so I think on that side, we know we have the same intent. So how do we continue to work together and find those answers? And I think uh, that's why I wanna say, no matter what, we're gonna work hard to find those answers, move us forward, sustain and operationalize, uh, and focus on the learning and, and focus on, on each of those things. So uh, I wanna turn over, Sid, uh, if you'd like to start off, and, and Matt, thank you for really kind of taking the to lead on these. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Corey, for relieving me of the burden of perfection, because, uh, you know, I ain't close. 
Um, we, we're working hard, and, and really my intent here is to kind of provide a, a high-level um, update of, of where we're at, and I'm certainly willing to go as deep as, as you all would like to go. I'm certainly happy to gloss over the, the details if, if that is what you'd prefer. You know, the devil's in the details, and, and COVID has been bedeviling and detail-laden, and so it's it's just such a complex conversation. The, the, the most important update, I think, that certainly you, you'd, you'd have to live under a rock uh, to have missed, but it's worth uh, being being transparent about, and that is the, the guidance related to isolations, uh, which are when, when a person has been identified with positive, a positive uh, case of COVID, the isolation guidance that came down from the Centers for Disease Control, which then comes down to Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, which then comes down to local uh, public health agencies, was an adjustment uh, from where we'd, we'd been pretty much for well over a year and a half with the full 10 days of, of isolation. Now, to five days of isolation. And the CDC was uh, fairly adamant in their assertion that uh, that's based on the science that they've been tracking and following for quite some, some time, uh, out of an abundance of caution, had wanted to remain at that 10-day level, but are, are feeling much more confident in the data now that the, uh, the, the transmission of the virus, the shed of the, the virus uh, is, is particularly potent around the two days before symptoms occur and three days following symptoms. So that's where they came up with the, the five days uh, guidance. So that uh, everybody has transitioned uh, to that. That's not a Douglas County thing. So really along those lines then, the, you know, there's a lot of talk on what, what are our protocols and, and there's, you know, we've been through how many iterations of those. So just to kind of reground us to what we are currently operating under, and that is uh, for our typical school exposures, right? Uh, uh, our, the vast majority of our schools on the vast majority of our school days uh, are, are typical exposures of where a, a call comes to the school and says, my child tested positive for COVID, I'm letting you know. The protocols that are in place for that is we have a, a, a desire to notify the potential exposed uh, contacts, the kids that were in class with that student, the kids that uh, potentially could have been exposed. And that's that notification letter that simply says, want to let you know, keep an eye out, monitor for symptoms. Um, we, we strongly recommend you, you, know, you, you, you check constantly with your kid how they're feeling. Uh, oddly enough, or ironically enough, that, that really is the daily advice that all of us should be following. That's not a notification. We should all be monitoring symptoms constantly. But we send that letter out as a reminder to, to notify our public. And um, then the recommendations that follow that are, that are provided in that letter is we say, hey, we recommend you wear a mask for the next 10 days because if you were exposed, you're not going to know it for a couple days and then you're going to be at your most infectious point. In the next 10 days, we can safely say you're, you're, uh, you're past that. Um, test on day five is also a recommendation. Again, if it's going to show up, there's, they're pretty narrowing in on it. it's that day, you know, day four, day five is when it's going to show up uh, and then monitor for symptoms. So again, those are recommendations that go along with a potential exposure and that's the vast majority of what our, our schools are doing right now. Um, outbreaks is where the conversation really turns a little bit more complex, probably what you tend to get more uh, community engagement in uh, related to that because that's where you start talking quarantining and, and do, do I need to be out of school? Do I need to come back to school? Um, just a, a point of clarification because I, you know, we, we have been listing and, and trying our best to notify when which of our schools or programs are in outbreak status. Well, when we went on break for two weeks, that gave us the 14 days to kind of clear the slate of potential epidemiological links between our school community members. So we started back at the first of the year with, with zero outbreaks. And uh, we, we almost made it through a week and a half. Uh, we have our first one declared today, as, as we predicted. We, we knew this would, would happen. Uh, but hopefully we can, we can uh, you know, keep, keep our outbreak statuses to, to a minimum. Really, our outbreak status is not something we determine. That's something that is determined in conjunction with our, our health partners, Douglas County Board of Health uh, through Jogan works with us to determine that. They work very closely with our nurses and our, our, uh, our building staffs. 
once they declare that uh, a, an outbreak has occurred, which is five or more cases that can be linked, we know this kid got it from that kid who then passed it to this kid. When we have that link, that's where we say, now, now we're in outbreak status. Outbreak status simply means we're gonna take another layer of vigilance around, okay, we know it's there, and we know that, that uh, we've got a pooling of, of uh, potential virus infection in this area. That's where we want to take uh, an extra layer of protection. Really, the, the changes that have occurred here is that, again, this is only for a school that is, or a program that is in outbreak status, not for our typical schools. Same idea. We find out who was that positive person exposed to. Then that's really where the, the, the options, the new options that we've worked with our Board of Health uh, and Jogan Health Solutions to to uh, to to guide our system is it begins with the question, so we're, we're, what's the vaccination status? If, if an individual is vaccinated, then there is no need for quarantining. They, uh, they are certainly able to continue on, stay in school. A recommendation, just like in the other cases of we, we think you ought to wear a mask, uh, we recommend testing on day five, uh, monitor for symptoms. In an outbreak, those are the things we would ask you to do, test on day five, monitor for symptoms. And of course, if you become symptomatic, go home. Uh, I begin isolation. If, uh, if an individual has not uh, been vaccinated or is not fully vaccinated, then you have two options. Uh, the first option is is being referred to as test to stay. Um, really, really, I think the better name for it would be stay and test, uh, because the option there says, if you're not vaccinated but you've been exposed, if you're feeling perfectly well, if you're not showing any symptoms, stay in school. We do need you to wear a mask. That's not going to be an option for you for uh, at least uh, the first uh, for, for 10 days. We need you to wear a mask, test on day five, and continue to monitor and, and, and carry on. No need to, to quarantine, no need to leave school. That's the test to say option. If a unvaccinated exposure uh, it prefers not to select that option, then the other option is then we need you to quarantine again for those first five days because we know that's when you are, if you happen to have been infected, that's when you're most contagious. After those five days have expired, you may come back to school, continue to wear a mask till that 10th day for the, for the remaining five days, so that's where the 10 days come from. Uh, wear, wear the mask, again, test on day five, monitor for symptoms. So that's, that's really very much the, a high level picture of where we're at with our uh, quarantine and COVID protocols, again, very much um, a, a collaborative work between uh, Douglas County Health Department and uh, special kudos to uh, Celia Flanagan, our coordinator of nursing, who spends tireless hours uh, talking about this mind-numbing uh, stuff that is just so uh, so challenging to grapple with, but but has to be dealt with. And uh, Dr. Kelly Smith, who uh, oversees our nurses, she's just been a great uh, companion and support in working with Jogan and Douglas County Health Department. You know, uh, it, there's a lot of question about what's required. And I think when you talk about work with CDC, CDPHE, and local health departments, there's recommendations and guidelines. Uh, even some of the confusion coming out with CDC and the new guidance and even recent changes. Uh, you know, the question comes back to why why don't we have, you have to test to return after being positive. And even on Channel 9 News this morning, talked about that same question coming out from CDC. And in all reality, we're encouraging testing. We want to encourage tests during the process, uh, it, it, even after. But to require someone to come back makes it very difficult because uh, you can test positive with both tests for weeks or months to come. And that, you know, as they look at that piece, that's the hard thing to say, are you gonna show negative? Therefore, that's part of the reason why CDC did not require it. And you don't see that with CDPHE, and then with local health departments. Uh, as we work through, you know, we are working and, and, and building more collaboration together uh, in setting these protocols. Uh, but that's true, not just within Douglas County, that's true everywhere. Uh, so I just want to, you know, we get a lot of these e emails. When we talk about engagement, uh, as we talk and I talk with other superintendents, we do our best to respond to emails. We try to call and have those conversations. Um, you all respond to emails and have that. And, and I think 
you put us compared to other districts, I think our, our, our personalization and our trying to engage and answer and be responsive, uh, I would put up against any school district. So when we talk about those positives, we aren't perfect. Sometimes uh, it's an inundation uh, and it's very hard to do that with everybody and well. Uh, but we also then try to get out FAQs and take those questions. So if it's not directed to an individual, we try to take each of those and get it to not only to, to our staff, to you, but also out to, to the community and everyone else. So, so I encourage everyone to go back to, to look at our website, to look at those FAQs. We try to update it, build that in. Um, and they change. They evolve over time. We get better at it. Um, so I just want to make sure as we go through those things, we, when we think about what's happening within the second semester, uh, as, as things came, as, as we came back, you look at our positivity rates within students, and let's say our student age, um, we're very similar to other districts. Okay, including into this week, we're very similar to other districts. In fact, we might even have lower numbers than districts that are smaller than us. But reality, and I'm gonna let, let Mr. Reynolds explain it better, but COVID's in our community, therefore it's gonna be in our schools. Uh, when you listen to the to, to the health officials, uh, even today, uh, reality is uh, Omicron ha is the dominant variant now, but it's also showing some patterns that they're seeing of severity that is less. Not with each. Sometimes it's different for individuals, but severity that is less. A uh, hospitalization uh, that is different than what it's been before. So when we start talking about where was COVID a year ago, uh, even to six months ago, sometimes even to six weeks ago, um, it's different. That's why policies have changed, work has changed, uh, but we're gonna work through each of those situations and continue to evolve and do that. And I think that's a testament to, to quality planning, to being adaptive and responsive, to collaborating and working with others, but, but it's, a, it's a commonality across. Uh, there are bus routes that were canceled in other districts from day one because they didn't have people. There are classes or grades or even schools that are remote right now in other districts. We have districts that are real remote running right now. And so as we come back and we're operating, uh, I will give kudos again to, to the planning, the protocols of work, uh, that we are, we're doing well. It's not great, it's not perfect, we could be better, uh, but we're doing really well right now and, and we're maintaining, we're sustaining. And uh, learning is happening and we will keep, and I want you to know this, we will keep a temperature gauge with our staff, okay? Um, and we have to look at those tipping points and we'll continue to be proactive to communicate with you and others uh, uh, with those tipping points. Uh, um, but is it perfect? No. We're asking a lot, we have to maintain. I need to keep asking people to say, stay with us, keep doing more. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna get through this. We are seeing modeling that hopes that it's, it's not only topping right now, but hopefully decreasing like you see. And, and uh, we heard that from our healthcare system, uh, two different hospitals today that talked about that same pattern, what they're hoping for, including staffing. Uh, so I think you look at safety, positivity rates, severity rates, hospitalization rates, and then sustainability. Um, those are some realities. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn it back over with Matt uh, to go over a little more of the detail. He does this much better than I do. Uh, thanks, Mr. Reynolds. Always a pleasure, uh, directors, to talk COVID data um, with all of you. Um, not part of my job description, but you know what? It's, uh, it is uh, two years into this, so I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with uh, what we have. So one of the things that was identified back in uh, your resolution in December was uh, what was termed uh, severity data points, which are, are deaths and hospitalizations. We've included that is, um, they can hear me now? Perfect. Um, so those are some, some data tables that we pulled directly from uh, Tri-County Health Department. It's a question I get a lot is why do we continue to use Tri-County Health Department? Uh, they continue to do surveillance data and monitoring data for us. Um, so we continue to use their resources. And again, with all of these data sources, I do cite it so that people know what they're seeing. Um, if you were to pull this data and look at it versus CDPHE, for example, you may see some variations in how it's pulled and how it's reported. So I always want to make sure that uh, you can see the dates on there and, and what are, where I'm pulling that from. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there are also some other data points that, that we do look at um, that uh, were not just those two, but also looking at some pediatric case reporting. Uh, again, this is community uh, data points from Tri-County Health. Um, and as uh, Superintendent Wise just mentioned, uh, the data from our community gives us a window to what's in our schools. Um, it's a window because we don't 
implement universal daily testing to truly know what's happening in our schools. Um, and as a data person, that's really interesting for me to have, but um, not reasonable for us to ask. And so this provides us a, a window of opportunity to be able to see it. Um, if it's in the community, it's in our schools, we see the same trends. When you look at our own case level counts that's on our website, you'll see a similar patterns of peaks and valleys between what we see in these numbers and what we have for case counts on our websites. Um, again, it's that same connection. Um, next slide, please. Oh, back one. Uh, this is a visual uh, for the same data. Uh, the visuals are, are something that's nice to be able to see because you can see it right off the bat in terms of where our peaks and valleys are for all of our data points. Um, interesting to note the variations between the different age groups. Um, they are similar in terms of the peaks and valleys, but when you zoom in, you are going to see variations uh, between that data points. But when there is a big spike, it typically hits all age groups, similar to what we see in that gray area. Um, now that gray area is still gray because they still have to validate that data. Um, it does take, you know, Tri-County Health time to be able to process and validate that data. So there's, you know, several weeks where they have to validate that. So, but, you know, if you look at it, um, we like to see the drop um, at the end. It's nice to be able to see that peak. And so we'll continue to monitor that. Um, next slide. Um, another data point that's very interesting for us is this idea of vaccination rates within our community. Um, and not only that, but our specific age level groups. Um, again, it gives us a window to see uh, where we are as a community. Um, the variations between these different age groups, as you recall, they do it in phases. So they release the, the first phase, um, was allowed to get vaccinations, then the second phase, and then the third phase. Uh, so you do see the variations between these numbers as these phases are just being rolled out. The latest was the younger group, which is 5 to 11. Um, that was the latest group, and so that's why you see um, the lower numbers there. Uh, the good news as a county, uh, you can see we're 83 percent uh, for both initiated and completed, uh, which is really good. Um, that's a, a very good number. And the vaccinations are important, as Sid just re re referred to. We get to have different options when you have vaccinations in play for outbreak status, which is helpful for us. Um, next slide, please. Um, operational data. Um, so this is something that uh, we are keenly aware of um, in terms of our daily texts back and forth um, as cases come up and we monitor the sub Fill rates um, are very, very important to us. In addition to that is just seeing the overall impact of how many people are absent at any given time. Uh, general rule of thumb, uh, 80 to 90 percent. We, we love to have over 90 percent sub-fill rate uh, because that allows our other staff to continue to do their primary job. Um, that 10 percent is where we're doing internal coverage and things like that. Uh, we would like to have all people continue to do their own primary job. When it's below that number, is where we start having trouble filling positions um, and filling different staffing needs. So we monitor that closely at a daily snapshot. Um, in addition to that, we look for hotspots. Uh, we know that some schools get impacted. We'll have a school say, you know what, today we have nine absences recently reported. How do we respond? Um, and not only how do we respond, but because of the new rules, you respond 10 days and five days out. Uh, so you look at five days out from that first report, so that begins to help us plan. So then we can look and say, okay, do we need to send another blast out for subs or do we need to look at other ways of staffing? Um, our schools are rock stars in this. Um, and that's, you know, they look through it first. They do their initial run of staffing through subs. They have their own checklist for internal coverage if it gets to that point. Then we have that additional layer of looking at central office staff to say, okay, where can we go? Uh, today was prime example of that, nine o'clock. This morning, we got a text that says we need some uh, different positions. Uh, who wants to teach French today? Um, and so we go back to our teams. I start with the directors. Uh, directors, um, any of your staff that are available to juggle their schedule. Um, today was a prime example. We had uh, professional development going on. We uh, shuffled that around, made people available. We were able to report to a school, provide three additional staff. Now, three additional staff may not seem like a lot, but for that building, it seemed like a lot because now you're able to not consolidate sections, but continue to provide uh, services to kids. Um, a data point at the bottom is just that average sub rate. Again, we like to have that above 90%. Um, and the overall numbers of subs is very interesting for us as well, uh, to make sure that we're uh, being able to be accountable to all of those vacancies. We want our sub pool to be very deep. Um, and the depth of that sub pool is also impacted by COVID uh, because we have people that make those decisions of not covering 
uh, because of exposure or their own exposure to COVID. And so both of those are really, really important. Um, I wish that there was a, a great formula for this. Again, I'm a data person. I'd love to have a mathematical formula with this. But really, every day is a unique challenge. Um, when we initially get that first text or we get that first call that says, hey, we have a problem, some schools who have high levels of sub-requests can fill it quicker than others. It just depends on the scenario. It depends on who's being impacted. Um, the classified version, as uh, Superintendent Wise talked about today, people don't always think about the classified versions, but we had impact with classified staff positions this week. So that's a unique thing because people think of subs. We don't often have subs for classified positions. It's very similar to bus drivers. So when that came through, it's active brainstorming. Well, how do we provide coverage for, for classified stubs? Um, and some of that's pretty fun. I mean, we get a chance, I get a chance to do lunch duty um, in a couple of days just to be able to cover that. So very unique. Um, and, and with that, I think I'm gonna close the data part unless you all have questions. So, you know, as we talk about this, um, we want you to know that, that I want to say to all the subs out there in the system, last year we asked for more people responded. Uh, we see currently, uh, I'll give you an example, Cherry Creek was in the 50% today for sub rate. So every district facing this, we like to be in the 90s. We're not right now, but we, we have more absences than we normally do, but we're able to respond. Um, with, with the five days, as Sid said, um, that level of timeout has an impact. Those protocols have an impact on us and our ability to sustain and operationalize, but having only five days, it does help with that impact. If people do not have a fever, if their, if their uh, uh, symptoms are resolving, if they wear a mask coming back, we have less of that sustainable impact, both for learning impact and also for our staffing impact. So there's pros and cons with everything. And how we start to weigh it out and, and, and do that well is a continuum. Um, but also when we start looking at this, uh, you know, as we were in December, we had about 24 ADA requests for students and additional 17 as we went on. We have worked to resolve with each of those. We do have two classrooms that, that need universal masking and people have responded. And so we start to say, how do we go in and, and evaluate? It works with the medical documentation. The doctors are doing a great job partnering with us and the families. They partner with the, the principals. The principals might bring another resource that we have um, and we work through those. Um, that's a commitment that we will continue to make. So as we start to evolve and look at all these practices, um, we'll get better with some, we'll learn to adjust, even like uh, Matt said, um, to go cover lunch is fun, it's a good break. But we pay all the other individuals beside us cabinet level, that way we have time and we need to do that. Um, but it's also a nice break to get over and do lunch duty. It also pitches in. Uh, we still have to get our job done, so do others. So, so that's how we have to find that balance of it. There's not a perfect uh, scenario. You have to say, how long can you do it? But I also believe um, when you look at the variant and the modeling out and where we're getting to and even where, where we're seeing, um, if we can get through a few more weeks, I think it'll decrease. Even projecting it tomorrow a little bit less. So some days are better than others because people start coming back, maybe have less that are going out. Um, so each day, is a, each day is a little bit new endeavor. Um, but right now we have the numbers and I wanna say if you're out there and you want to sub, jump in, please. We'll pay for your, your processing, uh, your licensing fees to sub and we'll get you going as quickly as possible. Those of you who aren't active but are willing to get active again or do more days, uh, we have, uh, we're finding ways to incentivize, uh, have a higher rates um, as our neighboring districts. Um, but we want to value you. So not only on a daily rate, but if you do so many days in super subs, so then in other words, if you, if you have more days in a school year, you get paid even more from that. And that added rate, um, it, it equates to a lot more. So, uh, so I, I do that extension to say thank you, but we could always use more. Uh, so, so jump in. Um, so questions uh, that you have, uh, Danelle? I just want to emphasize how very complex and difficult this continues to be for us and how appreciative we are of our staff and our schools and our leaders who have really stepped up and are working day and night and our parents who are working alongside us to help us with this situation. I mean, everybody in this organization is working 
as hard as we possibly can to help to support this really challenging circumstance. And we continue to do that. And um, it's late, late text nights all weekend, et cetera, to do everything we can to keep kids in school safely. Um, so I just wanted to piggyback on that. Well, and you, you talk about cabinet level. Sometimes people wonder, what do cabinet positions, what are they, what do they really do? Um, the amount of time and work it happens, I'll say this, the past two years of any of the holiday breaks, cabinet members have had to work, including this winter break where people have days off. And I will even say this, this team is covering schools, covering departments, but also covering over break when they have time off and they take up hours to meet and plan. So I need to give a shout out to this group also, um, even some that aren't here. People, people get COVID, even on cabinet, um, people get COVID. And so you cannot be here um, and your families are impacted too. So it's all of us our, and our community on that side. So on that side, I just wanted to give a shout out to the extra time even over, over uh, the winter break um, where, where this group and others were meeting and planning and putting things in place. So what questions do you have? We, you know, there's complications. Um, it's gonna, there's gonna continue to evolve, but what questions do you have for us and, and what do you wanna know? So sub process is a question, Amanda. So Amanda's up on the screen. I'm gonna let her explain a little bit about this sub process to become a substitute teacher. Yeah. So, Amanda, what's a process? How long does it take? What's a fingerprinting piece? What's a part with CDE? What's a part with our district? Can you walk us through the process to become a substitute teacher? Yes, absolutely. My pleasure. Um, and actually, we're just getting ready to send our latest update this evening and again tomorrow early morning to just be as proactive as possible. So we welcome and, and first of all, thank all of our community members, our student teachers, our staff who are taking on separate assignments. Um, to help with subbing. We welcome more subs. We never are done hiring subs. So to become a sub, there are a few different steps and you can find all of this detailed out um, on our district webpage, go under human resources. And then there is a page, uh, a side tab called um, licensed certified subs. So that will guide you to a link in which um, you start at CDE. CDE requires that uh, there are various levels of licensure. One could be that you are um, an amazing retiree that wants to come back and sub, and you would be given a certain level of authorization. Then there are those who would have a bachelor's degree that would get another level of authorization, and or those with a high school diploma of which we review and vet um, all candidates, um, including reference checks. But the first step is to do so with CDE they run their background and they have you apply with them um, in order to ensure of your fitness to be prepared to work with kids. After that is done, then you would apply with us and or simultaneously you can apply with us. We check references, we will reimburse you for fingerprinting that you do with us and for your CDE licensure fees. And so once you apply with us, we will get you in as quickly as possible. We have our own fingerprinting system here and can do so in an expeditious manner. We're um, hiring on additional individuals now. We have weekly orientations for our subs to onboard as many subs as possible. Um, so just know that we are here to serve and support you. If you have any questions at all, reach out to Human Resources and we can connect you with our sub office on this process and we'll ensure that we work as quickly as we can um, to process all requests and review all hiring processes. Um, and we do have the authority and the um, support from CDE to help expedite licensure at CDE as well for Douglas County. Reality though, Amanda, if you can share, it is a process. It does take a little bit of time. So when we say expedite yes. and try to get yes. this going as quickly as possible, can you kind of give an estimate of how much time? Absolutely, absolutely. So for example, to apply at CDE, they're gonna ask you some employment questions. They're going to have you answer some questions that are pretty standard on any employment application about work history and things like that. Um, it could take um, up to a week to go through that hiring process uh, with CDE or, or the licensure process. Then you can also at the same time apply with us so that we in the meantime can be checking your references. 
can be getting everything else aligned for you to come work for us. So um, on shortest, it could be up to two weeks but we want to get you signed up for fingerprints ahead of time. We want to do as much as we can ahead of time and or while waiting um, for your approval from CDE. Once you're approved from them, we can work as quickly as possible. So we've been going through COVID for a couple of years now, um, and I repeatedly hear you know, our staff's doing everything they can and they're stretched to the limit. Um, and they still are. So I'm just wondering, what are we doing for mental health for our staff and for, you know, thinking about how we're taking care of our people who are performing to their max and, you know, giving up their weekends, you know, Communications working 24 seven. I mean, everyone's working 24 seven and it's going on two years. What can we do to help mental health and show our appreciation to staff? Is that something that you've been thinking about? You know, that's something that we think about and try to apply on multiple occasions. I think first and foremost, uh, being out and modeling, doing the same thing. Um, being willing to, we'll cover custodial, we'll cover lunchroom supervision, we'll cover classrooms. Uh, I think it's part of it because you notice and you jump right in. I think the other part that we, we have done uh, is we did have a, a stipend that went out to all employees to say thank you for the extra work of the past and the future. Um, now the reality is we like to do that all the time, but you aren't able to do that all the time. But we have to remind to say, uh, we want to say thank you, want to show appreciation, we want to model and do that work with you, uh, but also to remind to say this is another piece of it. Um, and I'd also say each of our schools try to take care of their staff, and each of our department leaders uh, try to take care of that, their staff. And so um, there's no one perfect way. I'd love to hear from our staff and everyone what else can we do, what matters more to you. And sometimes what matters to Danelle is different than what matters to Andy. Uh, so when you think one size fits all, you, you want to know what motivates and, and keeps people going. The last piece that I, I think is reality, and I'm going to say this, I heard it from, from Sky Ridge. Um, their staff is tired. Everybody, for the most part, their staff is tired. Families are tired. Kids are tired. Um, we have to remind ourselves we're not alone. Uh, we have to remind ourselves we will get through this. Uh, we've Thought we're the end is coming sooner than later, but we also know uh, we're going to continue to get better and it's going to evolve and, and things are improving even when you can't always see it and feel it. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's an add-on. It's a stressor. Um, you, you listen to the, all the industries talking about the great resignation and, and, and the work piece. Uh, we don't want people to get burnt out. I understand the struggle and I think you empathize, you understand the struggle, but we're all going through it in different ways. Uh, but we all need to help each other get through it. So what I'd say on the mental health side, uh, we are trying to build in those, those mindful practices. We do it at principal meetings. Uh, so at our DLTs, we go through and we bring in uh, Jolie Jones, who, who works with us with our, our retreats. She does mindfulness and try to work on stress for, for leaders and everything else. I'm going to let Amanda jump in, but we, we try to do that at, at a district level, a department level, and everything else uh, to be mindful of and on top of, of how we recognize too. So Amanda, you want to jump in? Thank you so much. What a great opportunity for us to share about the, the multitude of wellness uh, resources for our employees. First of all, um, we do know that we have our employee assistance program that offers mental health services, um, family care resources, uh, many, many more resources there. And so all of our employees can go online into the human resources site and can also look under employee wellness. So um, of course, HR can guide you there if, that, if that's a struggle in finding it. We also have virtual mental health um, opportunities too through various other um, free sites um, through benefit providers and outside of our benefit providers. We have other employee wellness pieces, whether that is the calming corner and there's lots of mindfulness exercises, mindfulness activities that meet many kind of learners and preferences of what means calm to you and, and what is that meditational or de-stressor to you. Lots of opportunities through, thank you, Holly Huron and all of our site wellness champions. 
um, to each of our school sites. We have a wellness champion and I think almost every single one of our schools and thank you to them and thank you to our classified mentors as well who know and have a lot of these resources to share and offer. Um, we do have um, building sites. We have um, various monthly challenges. There are uh, different uh, practices and things we can offer, whether it's working with time and scheduling, being a parent and um, being a, a working professional, um, lots of different resources, employee discounts. We have um, financial supports as well and, and um, free counseling for that. So uh, we, and if there's something that, that our employees need that we uh, do not have, please reach out personally to me and let me know and um, if we have it, we'll share it. And, and if it's something we don't have, we'll definitely look into. But, but I just have to say over and over to our employees, there are so many free resources available that we will be sure to put in our um, HR corner part of our newsletter this month uh, in partnership with communications. And, and just know we are here to serve and support. Um, and there's so much to offer all of you. Amanda, thank you. That's really helpful to hear. Um, I guess the second part of my question, are there additional resources that could ease the burden on the system? Like if additional resources were available that would help in some way. And I'm, I'm really concerned about those building leaders that are working all weekend long, right? And, and district level individuals who are working and there aren't breaks happening. And maybe I'm overestimating the, the pressure, but it feels like it's that level of pressure that's been on the system. And we're not talking about like a month. I mean, we're talking about two years now. And so as we are working through the pandemic, which is still happening, are there additional resources that could be allocated that could lessen the stress? I think it, we try to engage with our leaders at our monthly meetings. So of course we have our level meetings on Thursday. So that's elementary, middle and high school. And we typically reserve a segment of that agenda for COVID support and updates. And I think your question is a really good question that would be one that I would be interested in hearing from our leaders, especially now that we're just two weeks after the break and we've incorporated all of our, you know, updated or revised protocols, I think it's a perfect time to get some of their feedback, which we do typically anyway, but that's timely and that this is just a, two days from now. So I think we would be better able to answer that by listening to them. And I think it's something, uh, Matt, jump in. I think it's something that we can continue to ask and ask principals and say building leaders to say each building might be a little bit from what their needs are. Uh, I'm gonna let Matt, Matt jump in. I'm also gonna say, um, where I give kudos, where maybe there's not a lot of kudos given to this Board of Education to asking about, can you sub? Can you volunteer to sub? Uh, can we, we have a policy of conflict of interest that you cannot be an employee at our district, but is this a time where we look at that for a temporary time uh, to provide some more support to our schools? Whether that happens or not, to offer and to be willing and to be part of the team uh, and do that, I, I wanna say to you, thank you for doing that. And then we were, we'll explore all those possibilities on that to you. So I think, I think you need to hear that also on that side of how do we give, I think all of us recognizing and, and reaching out to it. So Matt, keep going. Yeah, I think one aspect of, there's always a silver lining. I'm a glass half full kind of person. Um, so one of the things that you know, has caused us to re-examine what we do um, in the last two years, you re-examine what your priorities are. Uh, you re-examine what's, what's an immediate need and what's a priority. And to credit to our two deputy superintendents and our superintendent is, what can we look at what's on that plate um, and take that to the leaders and say, well, what really is a priority? And one way to lessen people's plates is to have authentic alignment between your initiatives so that you're not overburdened with the initiatives. Um, and I think the three of them have done a really nice job of that this year of aligning the, the strategic initiatives so that we're not adding additional things to the plate, but we're by no means where, where we want to be. We want to continue to evaluate 
what we're putting on the plates of people and also more importantly, what we're taking off of people's plates. So it's gonna be an ongoing conversation. I'll say one last thing that, and with Amanda up there, you know, it's been brought up that we do have classified. So we have, we have licensed and we have a way in which to pay for coverage. We have admin, which below cabinet, we are, are trying to pay for coverage as we do license. Our classified groups, especially that we see and we're having right now some classified uh, groups and, and people that, that need coverage, we need to look at it for the classified also, because we are doing different coverage. And when people do more, they still have to get their job done. So, so uh, to recognize uh, each of our employee groups and how we do that is a little bit complicated and different, especially when you get an hourly. But we need to address, when you talk about each of our departments who uh, classified and call that out directly of, of they're taking on a lot more. Are we doing it well? And what else can we do? And how do we think outside the box a little bit? So I think that is a, a group that um, we've kind of mm -hmm. talked about and, and but we, we will, th that's a group we need to, okay? Um, and Superintendent Wise, this is Amanda Thompson again. Thanks for the moment. We do have, um, venues in which we can show through um, additional compensation to thank our employees who are in the classified realms who are picking up additional responsibilities. Our principals do have that resource um, and that um, information available as well. well. We'll look at it once more and ensure that um, it's where it needs to be um, amongst all of our, our new situations going on. Um, I do wanna just say very quickly, thanks to our communications department. I know this sounds very minor, but yet it's major in that, um, Schools have these resources and so do we in all of our central office locations on the back of bathroom stalls. You will see lots of mental health resources and other wellness resources listed. Um, just as a reminder, and over time, those things can fade when you see something familiar over time, but I just encourage everyone to, to take a fresh view and see that there are resources all around us and the buildings in which we work and that can support us on our wellness. And uh, just to echo everything you said about thanks to the flexibility, thanks to the flexibility of the district, thanks to the flexibility of the volunteers, and I think the flexibility is really what's going to be the key to get us through that. Also, I really appreciate what Susan said about, and you, you said it right up uh, the beginning, Corey, about uh, keeping an eye on not just the uh, the effort, the, the size of the lift, but how long the lift goes on, is we do not know how long this, um, this cycle is going to last. Um, that being said, I appreciate the clarification. A lot of the emails I personally received or the communication was around, I'm not sure, I see a matrix. The matrix says test at five days. The matrix says this, the matrix says that. So I think just to summarize for the folks that we have here is we still honored what we did as a board, now admittedly a 4-3 decision, but we really tried to emphasize individual responsibility, parental choice, individual staff choice um, in how they assess their risk. And I think that's still in place. So just to recap, we have choice in masking with some exceptions around ADA and, and some things that we're doing, um, but we have choice in masking. We still have choice in vac vaccination. We are not dictating mandated vaccines uh, by any way. And with this new advent of the testing protocols, we have choice in testing dealing with the realities there. But we also have strong recommendations and, and that's something I think we need to look at. I, I think the message to the community from this board is yes, you have choice. Um, if you want to vaccinate, if you believe you are sick, certainly we're recommending stay home. We may direct to send you home if you're, if you're being symptomatic. Um, but we're also stressing um, vigilance. And I heard that message loud and clear. So whether you are vaccinated or not, we are seeing all types of breakthrough cases with the vaccinated and, and the boosted of all ages. Uh, I think we've seen a big shift since when we even did the resolution on masking. We're seeing uh, even the highest levels of the CDC saying, you know, cloth masks, Omicron really is not going to do a lot. And I think we've seen it in the data. Uh, Matt uh, Reynolds pointed that out very well, as did the superintendent. Um, we had two counties that not just in the school districts, um, but the counties themselves went to a full indoor masking mandate back in November. And we've had some good data and some time to see the differences between how those counties um, COVID cases uh, have tracked and hospitalizations. And we've had a chance to look at Douglas. And what we've seen is even though they have full indoor 
mask mandates in Arapahoe and Adams County, we are on the same track. In fact, we're a little on the lower side of that track. So I, I applaud the efforts here, but I would suggest to the community, um, personal responsibility, vigilance, and flexibility. The first and foremost ask is if you are feeling sick, if your student is feeling sick, don't even wait to test. Just keep them at home out of an abundance of caution. Same thing with the matrix coming back. Don't send your child back to fi at five days or you don't come back at five days, even though we're stressed, if you are still feeling symptomatic. I mean, that is just basic common sense. So um, the one thing I'd like to look forward to, though, that Matt kind of alluded to, um, we have this other aspect of immunity. One of the positive things we may be able to take away is if we have a case rate that expresses as Omicron looks to be expressing, we may have a huge case count but not have the associated hospitalizations and certainly uh, the, uh, the associated death count that we saw with previous variants. And I would hope that in along with our flexibility to respond and react and juggle schedules and things that we've seen, we also have the flexibility to start building in immunity. So when we look two weeks down the road, three weeks down the road is hopefully we're on the back side of this, that we could also bake in the fact of our students or staff members that did test positive, whether it was during the winter break, whether it was in this first week or two, and we can look at treating them as well as having immunity because they had COVID, they've recovered, they're now asymptomatic and they can come back. So I'd just like you to talk to that kind of beyond the next couple of weeks with hopefully a ray of sunshine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that very much, uh, uh, President Peterson. Um, I, I didn't want to change the slide because as a new guy I'm learning, you don't change the slide once it's gone to the board even if you get updates at three in the afternoon. So this afternoon at three, I got an update in regards to that. And it was in working with our partners at, at Jogan and Douglas County Health. And so we need to update because the vaccination status really now is more appropriately called Im Im immunoprotected or so something along those lines. We haven't come up with a good name for it yet, but vaccination and or if you have uh, tested positive in the last 90 days, you're you're also considered in that same category. You wouldn't have to quarantine, for example. So, yep, and as far as tracking those numbers, I'm hoping that our our uh, health departments and our, our state will lead us in a little bit more of the clarity of that efforts because certainly we are seeing unprecedented levels of, of positives, which are, for the next 90 days, at least giving, giving the same immunity. Excellent. Uh, excellent, I think that's where we'd like to move just as a, uh, is a group as well. We've heard it. We've heard 700 plus days to flatten the curve, right? And and why we have to deal with the realities of we have staff that are sick, we have students that are sick, um, and and thank you by the way for prioritizing. And and I heard it. Focus on the learning, not to say to take our focus off of the sickness, but really to look at the primary mission here. And if we can two weeks, three weeks, whatever it is down the road, come out on the backside of this where we're not tracking substitute numbers and we as a community have gotten over this. I think it's a serious conversation that the board should have. I know we have a meeting coming up on February 1st with a joint meeting with the Board of Education and with our county commissioners. And I think we should really look as a Douglas County team, education, government, our board of health and stuff, what we can really do to promote moving together and as much as possible ease these burdens and really move beyond that pandemic footing. Shoot, our, our governor said it. In fact, it was after our resolution. We had Governor Polis basically come out and say the pandemic phase is over. We need to move to the endemic phase and we need to deal with this while continuing our lives, while continuing our mission for academic excellence here in the district, while focusing on all the other great stuff that we heard tonight that this district needs, whether it's special education, whether it's capital uh, improvements, whether it's programmatic improvements. And, and again, I just hope we can get there, but, but do that together. I have several questions and thoughts. Um, I think just to start off with deep devils in the details, um, I think the message our community has heard is parent choice, parent choice, parent choice, parent choice. And I appreciate everything that you just said because I genuinely think that is our way out of this. Um, 
in the slides that we just saw alone, I think there were five different places where masks were recommended. The guidance, I understand it's not a requirement, but the masks, um, a piece of our way out of this from our experts is that masks can help. And in every single <laughs> incidence of when there is a reported case in a school, masks are suggested for those 10 days. How are we going to change that message from parent choice, parent choice, parent choice to overall responsibility at this point and make sure that um, the layers that we have promised our community that we're going to have in mitigation efforts are actually there. Um, one of the other things I see in the, in the actual details um, in the outbreak status where it talks about if you're vaccinated, if you're not, we're not tracking that. We don't know who's vaccinated. We don't know who's not. How are we adequately following these guidelines to make sure that we're actually keeping kids safe. Um, there's just so many things that sound great on paper, but with the billboard parent choice, I don't know how those are actually implemented in the way that they were intended to be implemented. So I'd love to hear thoughts. So Can I say something real quick. I know that I'm going to disagree I don't think we're hearing parent choice, parent choice. I think we're hearing take responsibility. With that parent's choice, we asked parents to take full responsibility for their kids, be the primary decision maker in what's best for their kid. And I'm not sure parents are sending their kids to school sick. Um, I just think that they are taking those. And, I, and even in my own case, learning through COVID, and I think a lot of people have learned, you don't go to school, you don't go to work sick. You, we have learned, we need to, the, the old days of, I got to go to work, I'm going to be sick, I'm just going to do it. And I think now many more people are taking the responsibility to say, I'm going to stay home. So I really think it's, there is parent choice, but I think parents are taking a bigger responsibility towards making sure that our kids are safe in school, all kids, just not theirs. So I'm going to do my best to um, to really say what's reality of what you can do. Uh, even CDC goes into the process of uh, you have a little bit of your own ownership of we can't track everything. Okay, even CDC, CDPHE uh, cannot track everything. So we have to. Be, there's a bit of an honor system in that. Um, how do you follow through well? Uh, similar to dress code with everything, it's ongoing and people are gonna do their best, but it's not gonna be perfect. The, uh, the positive that you find, right now Omicron, and hearing it, this is, this is what I am hearing from health advisors, even today, CEOs, two different hospitals, uh, representation from hospitals, Omicron is showing to be less serious. That's a good thing. Positivity is up, severity is not as serious, but I also would say it's probably not exact in that. Right, so we have to we have to look at each individual situation and go through that. Uh, but I think you look at trending, you listen to what's happening. Um, we are working with our our Douglas County Health Department, and they are continuing to partner with us. The role of a health department, any local health department, is to take from uh, federal level to state level to then your local level and put that in place. But it's also we uh, we're working with our our neighboring superintendents. They too are finding the same thing. Reality, even with universal masking at any time in which you've done it, it's not perfect. With masking and now coming back, or with not masking and now coming back to request a mask, it's not gonna be perfect. Uh, I've had questions of, how are you gonna separate in a lunchroom? You can't always do that. Can you have people eat in classrooms? You can't always do that. Um, even in all places, if you have every uh, grade level class eating in a classroom, um, when are teachers gonna eat? Because you can't get the supervision in each of those classrooms. So reality of what you can actually put in place and do. We don't want to sacrifice safety, but you also have to say, uh, what are the mitigating factors that work best? And kids are eating lunch together regardless. And sometimes it's asymptomatic. And COVID variants are changing. Um, there's, not, there's not a perfect exact answer. And I, I, it's probably not what anybody wants to hear. 
but I will say we'll continue to monitor. If you see a drastic increase or change, if there's a different variate or you see a different level of, of impact, we're going to have to adjust. We're going to have to come back and say, Here, here's our, our reality. So I think current states, um, we're tracking that data. Uh, we had a bit of a process going into winter break, but I'd also say Omicron now is the dominant variant, and, and you see that side. So I think we are now at a new spot we are monitoring and going through. Um, we have other things in place, mitigating factors, but uh, but it's going to have to be an ongoing piece. But I, I do think we have a good plan. We have a good work going ahead. Um, people are responding pretty well with that. Um, staff and students are responding right now, and we're going to ask, continue to respond. Um, let's see where we get to at the end of February where, or end of January, where we're in the middle of February, end of February, uh, because there is modeling and projections going out of what could could happen. And uh, it's not going to say that's going to be exact what happens here in Douglas County or in our state or whatever else. But I think you have to take from what you've learned from others and also build on what, what are we experiencing and adjust. So um, that, uh, that's trying to put some true reality in place and, and just being, uh, you know, I'll pass it over. I appreciate that. I, I have a slightly different version of reality, I think. Um, and, and I just want to respond briefly to what Becky said, but um, I have three kids in three different schools. I, my, kid, my kids have a competition right now going on to see how many, who gets the most exposure notifications. Um, I've got one in the lead that's had multiple exposures every single day at school. I have one that has five exposure notifications. Um, I I drop these kids off every single day. I see all of the people. I've talked with multiple schools that my kids are not at. They're having similar levels of exposures and the masks, the number of students wearing masks is not changing. My kids are not the only ones that are getting exposure notifications. So I'm sharing that personal experience to share that there may be a perception my my perception may be wrong that parent choice is the motto that's that's carrying our community right now, um, but I do not see a single bit of difference in how our um, masks are just an easy thing to see coming in and out of school or, or in class. It's an easy thing to measure. There are no changes happening after an exposure notification is issued. So that makes me wonder, um, are those mitigation factors that we're suggesting that people follow actually being followed? So exposure doesn't, re doesn't ask to wear a mask. So COVID is in our community enough to where you're probably being exposed every day, even outside of our school. So I would say it, it, absolutely you're getting a number of notifications. Here, yep. Mask, yep. If you so it's, it's saying there's guidelines to wear a mask. If you're positive, you need to wear a mask when you come back. But it's, it's saying best practice. Uh, it's recommended. Uh, it's guidelines to wear a mask. If you're positive and you're coming back after day five resolving symptoms, uh, we're expecting a little bit more. So I think even when you say uh, within those things, but but if you're starting to show symptoms, wear a, stay home. Uh, and then also when you're around others, wear a mask. So even at home around others with a, that, that piece of showing symptoms. So, you know, right now even access to testing is limited. Um, even when you get those tests back, how much time before you get those tests back. So I think guidance I'd say to you is, uh, again, if, you, if you're feeling symptoms, stay home. Um, cold or COVID symptoms are very similar. And so you need to go through those practices for what's best and we'll get you caught up. But it's not exact on that side. Um, and, and I hear you on a little bit of what it, what it says, but with exposure, um, I, I'm not so sure, and, and Sid can say this, whether it be in our schools and with Jogan, I don't know, I'm not sure you can say how close that exposure was and where, where it is, but we do know there is a positive case and trying to be exact of, of how close we're in those settings is that takes a lot of time in the contact tracing uh, and the linkages in that process to do that. And um, when you look at the tr transferability of it uh, uh, to, to narrow it down that much is difficult on that side. 
And we have a COVID strategy team that meets on a sometimes weekly or every two week basis. Like we meet regularly uh, in regards to the feedback that we are hearing from our building level leaders and staff and our executive directors of schools about some of the challenges we're facing right now, which is the number of exposure letters that our schools are sending in the messages that it's sending. Of course, we wanna do our diligence to inform our parent community. With that being said, we're, it's also gotten to a point where we've really had to evaluate whether or not, one, it's reasonable for, for us to be able to maintain and if it's really affecting what it was intended to affect. So those are conversations we're having right now. I know the mask issue, that ship has sailed. Um, you can't put it back in the box. I, I completely understand that. And I'm not trying to, um, I, I'm not trying to fight about masks. I'm truly just trying to share an example of how I feel like the, the current message in our community is parent choice reigns over everything. And I'm, I'm pushing on this issue so hard because I've, I've had great conversations with Mike. I've had a great conversation with you. Um, I've had a great conversation with multiple, multiple principals and leaders in our building. I am genuinely worried about pushing our system to bend and bend and bend until it breaks. And like Susan was sharing, our staff are at the edge of what they can maintain. And I mean, I will, I will tell you if we are still in a place where you are being asked to go out and fill lunch breaks in two weeks, we have to have a serious conversation as a board about pivoting because that is not sustainable. And I know it's new and exciting for a while and that new and exciting evaporates like that and it's burnout and you can't really recover from that with the current strains that our system is under. Um, back to the, the mask issue, I, I do not, I just wanna make sure that we are getting an accurate representation to leadership and an accurate message back to community. I think parent choice is very important. I do not think it is the end all be all. I think there are recommendations here to keep our kids safe. If this is, if masks are optional and parent choice is the option that we have chosen, which it is, there are secondary steps that have to be in place. And sending out an exposure notification, why even send it? if you're going to ask people to wear a mask for 10 days, test on, test on day five and monitor for symptoms, if we're not gonna do anything with that. The staff are being burdened enormously to send multiple, I can't even imagine the hours it takes just by the number of exposure notifications I get. If it's nothing more than a check the box, nobody's gonna wear a mask, nobody's gonna get tested, and everybody's already monitoring for systems, or monitoring for symptoms, take that off of staff's plate or do something with it. <laughs> Teachers know who was exposed. They know this fifth grade classroom had four cases, but nobody's wearing a mask in this classroom. It, there just needs to be an honest and real conversation about what we do with the pieces that we have put in place. And to um, just another piece of that, I don't know why we're bothering to distinguish in an outbreak status between vaccinated and unvaccinated if we're not following it. That's an extra burden that we're putting on our staff and we don't have the data to actually follow the process that's in place. It's just, it's just fluff. It's giving our community a false sense of a, a mitigation structure that's actually not in place. Um, very specific question that I just would like clarity on and I can get off my soapbox, but on slide seven in the second semester guidance, um, it says that we need to prepare to shift classrooms um, to short periods of remote learning in the case of significant operational impacts. I would like to know parameters of what that looks like and to understand more clearly what an outbreak Previously, outbreak status, we went remote. Um, sounds like that's not the case anymore. 
So what would be the, the guidelines that we're going to use to determine when it's time to shift into remote learning? So two things, note taken, next steps. We as a system with Jogan and board need to explore if we're putting things out there, are we really following? If we can't follow it, should we put it out there? It goes back to basic. If you can have a rule and you can't enforce it, why have the rule? Um, so I think we, we need to address that and look at it in the times to come uh, with Jogan and, and others to say, where are we with that? Uh, we are looking at our exposure letters currently and we'll take that back along with next steps. So, so point taken. I appreciate that. Also with the ability of staff to be able to follow through. Uh, the second piece goes back to if we need to move to remote, what does that look like? So what I'd like to do is kind of push it uh, to Danelle and Andy a little, or Danelle and Sid a little bit to talk a little bit about uh, what's it, what would it happen to those protocols to move a school, let alone it's a little bit different for a classroom. Classroom gets into the exposure of an outbreak working with Jogan and then they would say this sixth grade class. We've done that throughout this year and last year of a sixth grade class or classes all of sixth grade versus what's the protocols in which we'd have to push a school to remote for that temporary period of time. And when we talk about period of time, the one thing that does fall into place, it's five days. Now, those five days typically factor into, if I, if I test positive tomorrow, when did I first start having symptoms? First day I had symptoms is zero, the next day is day one. So it's not just when you test positive, but it's those symptoms piece, which goes to the five days. And there's some confusion around that of, of timeline, but that's also the amount of time a class or a grade level or school might have to push to remote uh, and then come back. So it's, it's, it's complicated in answer, but we definitely have metrics to start uh, working on. And let's start with the school side of it, uh, in which we look at um, number of positive cases, number of absences, substitute rate, and it's not only a substitute rate of that school, but of a district, because what we try to do is can we push them over? And then if we have a number of coverage in that one school, um, if we moved it to remote, it would put more subs out in the other system to where we protect them, we aren't pushing up multiple schools. So those are all variables, uh, and I'll let these two talk a little bit more uh, detail. I tried. To, I kind of gave a pretty good overview, but I think they can talk more of the specifics of that. I was just going to mention one thing. I mean, one of the biggest differences around vaccination on that chart, on that flow chart, in regards to a group going remote, and I think operationally to me means that you can't provide a teacher for that classroom, that you can't, um, that you don't have the adult in the classroom, that you can't meet that piece because that takes the vaccination status out of it, right? So, I mean, there's that piece in there. If you're vaccinated or not vaccinated, changes the outbreak. That's that's the biggest difference that I see now with the vaccination of, I can't remember the exact age group, but our elementary age students. So I don't, I don't know. I, I was trying to, I had, I thought I had a good answer for you, but I don't think that was. So maybe I shouldn't have asked Mike for the mic. It's getting close to my bedtime. There's so much complexity to every individual circumstance. And the fact of the matter is last year we were in a position where we had to transition schools for short periods of time to remote. And we had developed at that time a comprehensive process of all the considerations, the rationale for it, as well as all of the operational impacts to that school if we're in a position to have to shift to remote, whether it's uh, this year likely will be a five day time period. Last year when Andy and I worked together, we had to um, transition Rock Canyon for 14 days and many of our high schools at various different times last spring. So we do have, staff does have a comprehensive process. I have the document up right now where we look at everything that Superintendent Wise just laid out. What do we have in terms of numbers of cases? What are the operational impacts? Do we have sub coverage? Do we have an internal coverage plan? Do we have central office ability to provide coverage? It, I mean, there's so many different check boxes and our executive directors of schools work hand in hand with building level leaders as well as district level leadership at the cabinet level to evaluate every circumstance and we'll be in a position to have to shift if we look at all of those different criteria. and then we have it we will execute our entire communication plan as well we also have a process identified for transportation 
as, as Rich said earlier, in terms of when we have to cancel routes, we have a process for when we have to cancel base programs because we have had to do that for short periods of time since we've been back from winter break. We have a process as well for preschool program because we've had to do some shifting there as well. Um, and so I, I guess what I, I mean, I can, I can show the process, but I would want you to know that we do have one developed. We've all synchronized ourselves around the process when we get into that position, which we hope we don't get into that position, but we are prepared. We even first semester had to, for short periods of time, adjust a classroom to remote or a program to remote because of an outbreak, et cetera. So that's not brand new for us, just based on the continued revisions to what we're working through. In terms of monitoring all of the data when it comes to who's wearing masks, who's not wearing masks, should they be wearing masks, were they exposed, who's been vaccinated, who hasn't been vaccinated, that is a very complex process to manage all of that in the same way it is to manage all of the exposure notifications. And so we are always asking ourselves, what's the capacity of our staff and what is truly within reason? And how can we partner as best as we can with our parents to help support us with that? So when we ask, and we did ask first semester for vaccination information on let's say our high school students on whether or not they were exposed. We're, we're hoping we can do that in partnership and get that information, but the actual documentation and systems management of it, at this point, you've heard tonight how, how complex this is. It, it adds a whole nother complexity if we get to actually managing every detail of that. And I'm not sure our, anyway. It, it's, it's. And, you know, we've said we care about our staff. So one of the ways we have to ask, is it bang for the buck? Is it working? Is all that extra stuff we're putting on working? Is it worth it? Is it, is it making a difference? Uh, the last thing I want you to know, it's a school by school decision. Um, and some of the things also when you talk about engagement, that, that references a little bit of our work is we are a large district, but we are operating as a school to school basis right now. We're looking at what our school needs, what our classroom needs and acting uh, much more like a school based as a district um, rather than a large district protocol. Um, that same thing, every school district is looking at these types of measures and we have shared this with the entire Denver area superintendent group. So Jeff goes work and, uh, and uh, Superintendent Dorland over there said, we have one, we've done this, let me share ours also as you do it. So. Uh, we're, we're sharing those ideas with each other uh, as area superintendents because each of us are looking at what if we have to push our remote to school? How do you measure that? What's, what's impacting it? And each of us might be a little bit different within our, our district's measures. Um, even health departments of local health departments have different practices with their school districts. Okay, so Jeffco, different than Douglas County, different than Tri-County. Uh, uh, and so each of those create different parameters, also stressors put onto the system of operations. So I just want you to know that we, we've shared this, we're sharing ideas, uh, but we have a good practice and protocol within doing that. Um, but, but again, to get back to it, I, I do think we have to say uh, what's sustainable, what are the measures, and what's effective in making a difference, including some of the language uh, within that. And we have to work with our, our, uh, our health department and ourselves and our system and even each other of a... Uh, um, is it working, is it making a difference? And where is it, where are we now compared to a month from now? Because I, I do feel we'll be, we could be in a very different spot in a month from now. I'd like to really go back and, and measure that because uh, we found that throughout, you know, especially this year, um, it's been evolving. And, and last year uh, it was new to us and it changed even over the course of last year. My last question, my last request. Um, I'm just trying to think of any way to help our teachers, just like Susan was asking, what can we, what resources can we do? What, what process can we um, simplify? 
our teachers right now, and I've asked at multiple schools, our teachers are spending approximately an hour a day um, either planning for packing up all of their students' work to send home um, because their students have their classes out. Um, elementary, or I'm sorry, secondary teachers have hundreds of emails from all of their um, students who are not in wanting to catch up, wanting to do their work. That is not sustainable in any way either. So as, and I understand this is entirely in the weeds, this is 100% operations. I am just begging you to recognize that, um, and I know you do, I just need to say it, um, our teachers can't sustain even if they are operating, even if our schools are open, even if we are able to keep plugging through, when half of their class is gone, we're essentially asking them to do two jobs again. And we promised them we would never do that. And they're not teaching. They're not teaching two full class periods. They're not, they're not doing Zoom calls and, and all of the extras. But it, it is doing a lot of playing catch up. And I think it's also an important message for our community here that there are trade-offs. And when you move forward with one policy, it, it's always a scale that's in balance and something else that's really valuable to you in person learning might get tipped. And if we don't have universal masking, then some precautions may need to be taken and your student may need to be out of school for an extended period of time because, I mean, one of these requirements to come back is PCR tests. PCR tests are taking four days minimum to get results back right now. That's a long time to ask someone to have their child out of school and to have their teacher teaching in a classroom and teaching their students who are, trying to keep their students who are at home caught up. So just wanna make sure that's a part of this equation that we are considering maybe a little with a little extra weight point taken you've described our district and every other district in colorado and the nation and um i i think it's going to be it's going to be a measure over time that we have to continue we are trending just like every district every teacher in every school across colorado is probably feeling that same thing right now and I can say it uh, as a metro area of superintendents, um, you described very well uh, the state of education uh, with, with COVID right now. But, but I also feel as, as we look at measuring that, um, uh, there's probably not one good answer except what we said earlier, uh, we are recognize that people are stepping up. Um, our numbers are similar to others, but our, at least our sub rates are better. Let's keep that going, knock on, knock on wood. Uh, so let's, let's focus on, on some of the good things that are happening. But you, you've, Omicron is doing that to us regardless. And I, 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 you, you said it well, the masking piece right now is past, uh, but current state of all that same stuff is happening here, Littleton, Cherry Creek, Jeffco, Denver, Aurora, uh, throughout. Um, and mask or not mask, it's in our community, it is spreading. Let's hope it stays less severe. I don't want anyone to get it, but I definitely don't want it to, to be a more impactful. But you, you've described current state of cross. And I, you know, I, I think we all have ideas about what things could take that off, but I don't think there's a simple solution uh, that will change that same dynamic because neighboring school districts are experiencing the exact same thing. So Corey, just a, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, Susan, you've been waiting, go ahead. Well. I'll try to be quick. Um, I wanted to make sure I understood. You were saying school by school, they'll make the decision if it needs to be pushed remote, like a classroom or, or anything like that. Well, no. Schools will make that decision. Schools will make that with us. We have a system that we will make decisions by school. Um, to push out an entire district, uh, we had to do that once. as a totally different piece uh, across the entire metro area last year on operational. Um, that was an operational sustainability piece. Uh, where we are currently and will continue to be is, is um, there are some universities that have pushed to be remote, fully remote. Um, I, I think on that end, we were making decisions to go remote by a school, but a school will make that decision, but they'll make it in collaboration with us. A grade level a lot of times goes back to if it's a 
if it's an outbreak and a clear link to a grade level and starts spreading across a number of kids in that specific class, could be a classroom or a grade level. That That's a little bit different that we have measures, but but Jogan is directly involved with that piece, uh, whereas as we're looking at as, as a whole school, it's more on the operational side okay, um, that on that sense. side. So outbreaks is really my question. Before we say, oh, we can't do the process that's here, that's been recommended by Jogan and developed with us for outbreaks, um, I guess I'm trying to understand why the process is separate when it's an outbreak. And um, when I read through this, is, ma is the mask requirement required or not required? Because I think I've heard different things even within this one meeting, yeah, no, and I'm and, confused. And it is confusing. The devil's in the details. So it does become a requirement in an outbreak declared status. Yes. So, so that, yeah, it's a recommendation when it's in a typical positive exposure case. But once, a, once you're declared outbreak, then you have a higher level of vigilance in mitigation. Thank you. I, I'm just not sure the public heard that when we were talking earlier. So I wanted to confirm that. And then, you know, I've been talking about the strain on the system and, you know, and I've, I saw Corey writing down, okay, maybe we don't do some of this. Well, I just want to understand before making any decisions on our process, which has been recommended by the health experts, you know, if we don't follow a process like this, what are the implications? You know, what are the legal implications? What does that mean? And then secondly, you know, we always have options. You always have options. <laughs> so we could follow this process or we could um, not follow this process or we could hire additional staff to help fulfill the extra work that's required if we could find people to hire. But I mean, there are multiple options and I think it would be helpful to understand what all those different options are. And not right now, just. No, so just, I'm just sitting here kind of flustered, <laughs> to be honest with you, for our staff, for all of you. I mean, when I look at all the work that your team has done, I mean, it's just all the complexities and our inability to implement with fidelity is is basically what I'm flustered about. And, and it's, it's one of those things, and I think we said it earlier, is that we have these beautiful looking processes on paper, but we're not, we don't have the capacity to, to monitor, we don't we don't know vaccination status of students, um, and yet we're putting our staff through all these hoops to have to implement and monitor, and it's it's just really frustrating to me right now because I don't know the answer, I don't, I don't know how do we get around that, and like Susan said, you know we we also have implications if we don't follow something like this, um, but I'm just I'm just really having a hard time for. Our, our staff right now, especially our, our, our nurses and our health assistants. Holy cow, the, the heavy burden that's on their shoulders to monitor, make phone contacts and all that. So I, I'm, I'm wondering about them in terms of what support systems are in place for them. I know we did a, did a shout out for Celia Flanagan, but do we have, uh, do we have health experts who are, other than our Board of Health and other than Jogan, do we have health experts that really are being tapped and consulted? I mean, you guys are making these high stakes decisions about health and you're educators. <laughs> you're, you're not medical professionals. And so I just, I just worry about our capacity for navigating this and asking all of you to have that heavy burden uh, and having one nurse <laughs> in our county that's overseeing a lot of this and, and doing a lot of negotiating. And then you got Jogan. I don't know who their health experts. Do they have an epidemi ep ep epidemiologist? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that one. Um, so, so I guess I'm wondering about that and, and just need to shout out a frustration about how we're stuck in a really difficult situation um, because I think we, in some terms have complicated this more for our staff 
by doing some optional things. Um, and I'm not gonna beat the dead horse on masking because I think it's been beat up really well tonight. But I just think that we've done some of this to where staff have had to do the flow chart and, and things like that. I guess the other thought I have as far as staff fatigue that we're experiencing, the one thing that the board can do is we can modify our calendar. You know, and, and, I, and I wonder, do we need to talk about putting in place mental health days where we shut the system down and just say, this is a mental health day, staff, don't do anything school related. Um, I, I think, you know, I heard you saying, Corey, that, you know, even the healthcare workers are tired. Um, maybe we, we, we can give the gift of rest. And so I'm just wondering as a board if we should be thinking about that, if that would be be helpful. So anyway, I'm just um, spewing because I'm just frustrated <laughs> right now with what I'm hearing. And I'm, you know, and I'm thinking about Elizabeth too, you know, in terms of um, the burden that's on our leaders right now is just extreme as well as our educators. And yet we have these great plans, but we can't implement with fidelity. So why are we doing it? I guess. So, so First, I love your idea about potentially giving a mental health day. I think that's actually, um, I think it, it's definitely something we should talk about and consider. Um, I too actually wrote down pretty much the same questions, Elizabeth, that you had about, um, I, I have three kids as well in the district and I get notifications all the time. And um, sometimes, uh, like this week, I, I got one, I think yesterday, that said my child was exposed uh, last Tuesday. <laughs> so we were um, almost a week out, and I think that's pretty normal because, like you said, tests are taking four days. So if a, if a parent keeps their kid home, uh, they may not get them tested for a day or two because they're like, eh, what's going on? Okay, now I should get them tested. And then they do, and then they wait four days, they get a positive test, and then my child was exposed a week ago. So is it reasonable? to be sending all these exposure notices when I would say half of the time, it's way past even the time in which it would be important for me to be sitting there staring, watching symptoms. So that's the first thing. Um, and is it realistic to, to track all of the, the contact tracing, the vaccines, all, all of those things? But I have a question um, also about the um, outbreak status and I am not an educator, so I'm just gonna throw that out there, but would it be easier, instead of having half the kids at home because they haven't been vaccinated and half the kids in class because they have been vaccinated, um, to, to go remote for those three days, because what is it, it's five days now, so generally speaking, you have the weekend that's gonna attach to it and whatever else. I, just a thought, I don't, I don't know which one's hard, I don't know what's harder, yeah. doing two classes, one in class, one at home, I, or no, just going remote, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not, I, I don't want any of our educators trying to take on the lift of, of teaching in two, two environments. We've been there, we've done that, that was, a, that was a horribly taxing. The, I, I think the important thing to understand, and this is coming from um, you know, everything from President Biden down to the CDC to, you know, local, state level. The goal is to keep kids in school. They want to do everything we can to keep kids in school. And so that's why the message, that's why you can clearly see <laughs> this entire protocol is to incentivize vaccination. Because if you're vaccinated, you, you don't got to go home. You're good. We're, and only people that are going home are people that are sick. That's what the intent and the design of this is. That's why the test to stay option is now in place. And so the reality is, is I would far rather see entire, you know, a half of a classroom be willing to wear a freaking mask for a few days and keep coming to school, right? Because if you don't want to wear a mask, then you got to go home for five days and you, and you can come back. But I'm not sure I can put that burden on the teacher to make sure you get your five days worth of in concurrent instruction because you chose to not wear a mask and come to school for that day. I mean, it's just, you're right, we can't, the incentivization is to stay in school, get vaccinated, and if you didn't get vaccinated, be willing to wear a mask if you were exposed in an outbreak status. That's, that's really what it comes down to. 
the one thing I would add to that is vaccinated or not, if you're sick, you're going home, right? I mean, that's that's the obvious thing. And I know there's an incentive for vaccines built in. Um, again, I would caution all parents. I have a daughter that will not get vaccinated. She has clotting issues. We are worried about those. We've been advised, do not vaccinate your daughter by medical professionals. So again, it's it's again, it's it's a individual circumstance. It's an individual choice. Um, but back to what uh, Elizabeth said earlier, and, and I think it's a legitimate question. You know, everybody's seen office space in the TPS reports. The people just, you know, fill out the reports to fill out the reports. If the reality is that Omicron is present in the county, and by that I mean ubiquitously present, you are going to be exposed multiple times a day the way Omicron's working. And, and the data is tending to bear that out. When we look at our historical high, we are a, multi, we are a, a magnitude of factors in terms of cases higher than the highest place we've been in cases just due to the nature of Omicron. And it may have made sense when there was less case rates, but if we are honestly at a place where you're basically telling you're exposed is like telling you you woke up this morning, right? Um, and it is creating an extra burden on the system. And people are like, okay, the question isn't if I'm going to get a notification, it's yeah. how many am I going to get this week? I would really consider going back to the assume your child has been exposed, whether that is in the school, whether that is shopping, whether that is in a play group, whether that is in a whatever, just assume that, that we are all being exposed to some form of Omicron on a daily basis for the next few weeks as we track the data. And maybe we just focus only on those outbreak notifications because those are s much more specific. They're, they originate outside the district. There is a, a defined state criteria on five cases with this and with that. And then if the only things we're really focusing on are the outbreak situations, maybe we reduce some of the noise and reduce some of the burden that frankly is leading to the burnout is all the the extra administrative stuff. So uh, let one other thing, and I would just like Superintendent Wise or anyone to comment on it. One other question, I'd just like to hear clarification for those that are still listening. There's been a lot of questions or confusion that I've heard around my child is in ex charter school and what is the you know and i just think I, we want to hear it out loud that charter schools through their autonomy and accountability can put in very different protocols uh and just want to hear that for those charter parents yeah, that may and, be listening yeah i think that's exactly the and, and the 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 only fair answer i can give to that to any parent who asks that question is you need to contact your charter school because our charter schools are all operating under incredibly different guidelines and, and processes, and, and it doesn't matter whether they opted out of JLCC or not, they still have very unique and idiosyncratic processes that they're following. You gotta go directly. And Jogan calls me once a week and says, can you give me a list of all your charters and what they're doing? And my answer is, no, I cannot. But you can call them all and and get that information. And uh, but but and I wanted to just go back real quickly, uh, Director Williams, to your point. Much of this is a real problem for us. Those notification letters because it's it's when parents notify us. So they might have had their kid tested Friday. The weekend came. They didn't call us till Monday. Now we have that dilemma of, do we do due diligence by sending out a letter that makes us look like idiots? And we hate doing that. We we do that to ourselves plenty. We don't need extra help in that. And so we and we're sending notification letters home that say, because I saw it today, your child may have been exposed on January fourth and or January fifth and or January sixth and or January seventh. And those are all true statements because there were seven different kids and those calls came in different days and that kid was in contact with. But it makes us look like fools. It. It escalates the concern and the fear in the community. I would far rather us move it to a process that says, did you, did you leave the house today? You were probably exposed. Monitor for symptoms, be vigilant. Our health agencies have given us permission. They've said, you can do that. It's not a requirement. We're also trying to thread that fine needle of, we want to also convince and make sure our community understands, we, we still acknowledge that we, we want to do. We want to be good educators. Your kid was exposed. I want to tell you that. That's due diligence. But it has become very problematic. Just anecdotally, I had a high school today that had 150 positive cases. 
Now do the math, that's 150 students times seven classes times batching all of that. That isn't happening. That, that, that's where we're, we're struggling at capacity right now. That's where our, our, our buildings are saying we just can't do this anymore. We're, we're at a breaking point. Can, can I put one thing in context? Because I do hear a little bit of, of questioning. I, I have to say this a little bit is, this is every single district. This isn't just mask or not mask. This is every district that that is happening in every high school, every, every place, okay? So I, I just, I have to say this, just a way of understanding that, that it's not an anomaly of that high school or Douglas County, um, because, context and understanding and the greater picture of where it's taken. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's one or not. I think we have to measure that over time and look at the data. But I, I just I, I want to make sure we're putting it out there that it's not one single reason to blame. That's current state of Omicron COVID throughout. Um, so so um, again, I'm not going I'm, I'm not going to get into what and what's but 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 I just want to make sure it's clear. Okay. Um, I just had a question also on the outbreak status. So is this outbreak status being enforced or is it also a recommendation for people? Because I heard you say that you are forcing masks if in an outbreak. In an outbreak. Yeah. Okay. So those schools are required to wear masks. So well, yeah. Please do. Yeah, because I want to be really, I want to be really careful here. Because it, to, when you're declared an outbreak status, that could be as small as an individual classroom. That could be as small as an outbreak on this bus. That could be as large as an entire building. And so that's a very rare, you know, those are the polar extremes. But so where the outbreak is declared, that is where we, where we would focus these requirements: the mask, for example. Okay. So. Most of our outbreaks have been a classroom or a program. 30, six, 30 to, you know, five to six to 30 kids, typically. We, we do are starting to see our outbreaks with Omicron are going to be bigger. And so that, that reach is going to be a little bit bigger. But we've never gotten to a place where an entire uh, building in this new scenario is in outbreak status yet. Okay, so it kind of moves past recommendations on masks and goes into requiring an outbreak. Mask. Yes. So I I agree with Elizabeth in that it is sending a mixed message. And this is just my opinion that we're like, oh, you don't have to wear a mask because you know we're of the stance that masks aren't making a statistical difference, and they're actually, for me, I believe they are causing harm to a lot of our kids in their emotional IQs development. And so when then when we tell them they do have to wear it. Um, that's just my opinion that it's the name mix message. I'm assuming jo Jogan came up with this, but um. yeah, that, that was a non-negotiable. That was not something that we had uh, le leeway on, and that was that's very much our our health expert said. We're we're you know we're going to work with you on this, but in an outbreak status, their language is we take a little bit more control, and here are the things okay. that we will require to be in place. And 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 to your point, it's a calculus. Their calculus is. We recognize the dangers on both sides, having kids, you know, potentially exposed to COVID or having kids at home. We're trying to thread that middle ground somewhere. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I just want to say real quick, also what everyone else reiterated, just thank you so much to all the people in our district who have stepped up for substituting. I think we live in a great district that had made an effort to keep kids in person learning for that reason. Um, so thank you to everyone doing that and, um, yeah, and then I agreed with the exposure notifications. They need to be a little farther in between cause, uh, I know when my daughter was in daycare, I would get those if someone had RSV or something even before COVID, but if you're getting six a day, it is, it is interesting. So. I just want to clarify. I completely see value in sending exposure notifications. I actually appreciate, I mean, it does make you a little more attentive to when you're watching symptoms. My point really was that this is a significant burden we're putting on staff at this point. If the three, the three things that we're asking in that exposure notification is to wear a mask for 10 days and parent choice is trumping that 
message in in its actual in the way it's being um, implemented. Testing on day five, when you have a four day turnaround and we're not able to collect any of those tests, we don't we don't see them, we don't monitor them, we don't know if that's happening, um, and then monitoring for symptoms. Uh, something everybody should be doing. I just want to be really clear that it, it doesn't come across that I'm, I'm saying I, I don't see the value in those notifications because I absolutely do. Um, I just think there may be an opportunity there to help if, and we have two choices. We can bail on the exposure notifications or we can change our messaging and we can say this is what we actually need to be doing. These three points will will limit the number of cases that we have. If, if we believe our health department, we should be finding a way to say more than we suggest that you do this. If we're not going to have any kind of follow-up other than we suggest this, then, then quit asking everybody to follow and, and take the time to send these out. So what would you suggest? Well, I'm only one person. <laughs> um, and I don't think one person can change the message that parent choice rules in our district. And I know that can ruffle feathers, but we, we need to make a choice as a group whether this is something that we're going to implement with fidelity, like David was talking about. And if that's not something we can agree on, it's a waste of time. So, and I know Superintendent Wise has mentioned this grapple that other districts are facing in this regard as well. Being a parent of a student in another district, I also get the exposure letter that outlines those, those you know, encouraged recommendations, and yet they have also not found a way to implement a system to ensure that that is happening in each and every case. Um, now their exposure note, and we talked about this as a COVID strategy team, we talked about, you know, we talked about do we eliminate the exposure letter, but we didn't want to do that at this stage because for your very point, like there, we still definitely have community members that do want to be made aware of when their kids have been exposed, right? We talked about doing it at the end of the day, which is what we've been trying to do, and then now we're facing some challenges with that. We talked about doing it once a week because, in my experience as a parent, I get them on a weekly maybe basis, not on a daily basis. And so, again, getting to the point that if in an exposure we start to ensure compliance to mask wearing and testing, that will definitely overwhelm our staffs as well. So that's where that's always this challenge. So I guess one of the pieces that um, we have worked diligently the last two years to continue to develop partnerships with our local health department, whether that's CDPHE, Tri-County, or now our new health department, um, and in making a decision to change operational practices like that, we would want to be able to do that in conjunction with our health department um, to make sure that there's not unintended consequences if we do shift our stance to issue letters, not issue letters, and work with them directly to say, here would be the operational impact of us not issuing letters. Does that coincide and align to other per perspectives and other approaches? with other segments of our community that they support as part of our health department. So I, I think it's an ongoing conversation that, I mean, Sid and team has done a, an awesome job of continuing to work with them of problem solving. But even in that, it's active problem solving. I mean, we go back two years ago working with the health department where it was new for everybody. You're doing active dialogue to say, if we do X, Y, and Z, and they give us guidelines, and then we're like, whoa, whoa wait a minute. These are the impacts of that decision that you're trying to make. And then they would go back and forth with us and we would make adjustments to that. This is another prime situation. We're dealing with numbers we've never seen. We're dealing with incidence rates that we've never seen. 
The good news is it's a, a variant that's not as serious as previous variants, and we have vaccinations in place. Totally different ball game than where we were last December, where the incidence rates weren't nearly as high, but we had no vaccinations available. And so the process was vastly different. So every time one of these comes, and even the Delta variant was different. I mean, the, the guidance has changed since then. So every unique case, um, and, and I will say every unique case is equally frustrating to everyone involved. And to, just to comment on that, just to take a, a big step back, um, you keep talking about parent choice rules. I, I would say personal accountability is what we're stressing, right? Everyone look at your unique situation, look at your perspective, look at your risk analysis, look at your unique factors and make those decisions. And that's why we, we did what we did back on December 7th. Again, back to Omicron being the new thing. Let's step back. If let's pretend we didn't know about COVID and we just showed up at this meeting today. We have something that's expressing somewhere between a cold or, or runny nose in, in the best case for some people to something that's expressing somewhat like influenza from what we know. We have done this for years and decades. We've done with dealt with seasonal sickness. We've done with, uh, dealt with some really bad influenza years before COVID was a thing. And before we overthink it and say, well, if we get an exposure, we're now going to dictate to people, you must do this, you must do this, you must do this. Let people work it out. If we are truly dealing with something that is between a cold and an influenza, even though the case rate is off the chart, I think the superintendent has the right mindset. The first thing is operations, commit to the learning, uh, do what it takes to keep people in there. I love Director Ray's suggestion about maybe some pre-planned, at least for the next few weeks. Maybe we just take a day or two and say, you know what, we're going to take this Friday off and we don't want you to do PD. We don't want you to, to do other stuff. We want you to take a mental health break. And that is for the students, the parents, and the staff. I think that's a great idea. But I think we may be overreacting when we get to what Omicron is today. And let's live in today and understand what Omicron's doing, super caseload, but let's also understand that, thank God, it is not uh, anything really, with some individual exceptions, not minimizing those, um, somewhere between a cold and the flu. And I think we can, as individuals, for parents, for individuals, we have made tons of decisions around cold and flu season into including vaccinations. Some people get their flu vaccine every year. Some people don't. They get horrible reactions to the flu. And let's just, again, leave it up to personal responsibility. My suggestion, since you asked, um, and I am only speaking for myself, not for the full board, um, what does it sound like we should do is we should listen to Matt Reynolds and, and engage our health partners at the in Douglas County and say, we're having a lot of noise. There's exposure continuously, you know, whether it's school, there, there's just exposure continuously. What would be the effect of us not doing the just exposure notifications and focusing on those outbreak cases? Because now when you got a notice and it's an outbreak thing, we have some very directed things that we're required to do because the definition of outbreak and CDPHE can come in and say, you have an outbreak and you need to do certain things. Maybe we just focus on that second level and just ask everyone, hey, for the next few weeks as we work through Omicron, just monitor every day. We're, we're asking our staff to be hyper vigilant. We're going to have to ask our entire community just to be vigilant and monitor your own systems and take personal responsibility. That would be my recommendation. Okay, I'm not even sure where to weigh in. Um, I, th I guess I, I wish we could just even take the word COVID out. I mean, we're talking about sickness, right? And you still have kids missing school and you still have the same problem with the operations, right? So um, the masks have made a difference for sickness and spreading sickness. I mean, this is just how it works. And Danelle, I think you mentioned, you know, your child's in a different district and, but it's my understanding that the other districts do have masks um, being worn. And that's one layer, it's one, of many layers that can be used to help mitigate the sickness that's happening that is causing operational issues. And so 
I think the challenge and why I was trying to confirm earlier with outbreak status, we do have to wear a mask because there is mass confusion in the in the community. And you know, I just look at my emails, subject supporting parent and school choice. Keep let parents decide. I mean, I, I haven't been able to open all of them today, but the subjects on many, many, many of them are parent choice. It's not parent responsibility. So I'm just really worried that you know, if you have 150 outbreaks or 150 um, positives in a school, does that mean that will most likely be an outbreak? At, at this point, and Jogan is working on that tonight, they're, they're not thinking so. Um, it, that, and it's a, a very complicated process. We, we had that discussion this afternoon, and they said it's, it's got to jump off the page that there's an obvious and clear link that we're, we're following, pursuing. Could, okay. it okay. might. And I guess I'm just trying to think, how do we help parents understand there will be masks required if there's an outbreak? Because that's not what they that's not what they think. They think they have the right to decide. And so I, I don't know if there's a way to help with that communication. Don't know how important that is or not. But I do know we're meeting with the um, Board of County Commissioners, as you mentioned. And I don't know exactly what the agenda is for that meeting, but if it is dealing with any kind of COVID related topics, I would like to encourage having board members from Kaiser and Health Littleton Adventists and like we're, none of, we're a system. Like we shouldn't be making decisions or talking about issues um, and pretending like a decision at the school level isn't gonna impact healthcare and vice versa. And so I just wanted to throw that out for consideration because I haven't had conversations, you know, on what the agenda is. I've had a couple of people reach out to me from the community. I've had board members say, well, what's happening with the board of Douglas County Board of Health? Because, you know, in December we were going to be the liaisons and we went to one meeting, but I've said, well, I haven't gone to any other meetings and I don't believe there's been other meetings happening with the Douglas County Board of Health. So people are confused, people have questions. I think the more transparency we can have, and if we are gonna meet with the Board of County, and we are meeting with the Board of County Commissioners, if the agenda is gonna be focused around COVID at all, I think having individuals from the health industry, health um, hospitals there would be very helpful in the conversations. And since maybe you could expand on what that, that agenda would be or if you've had any conversations. Yeah, we haven't other than there's been a reach out to have um, some unity and some coordination and a joint meeting. I have yet to talk to the county commissioners regard to agenda for that. Now it's scheduled for the first. So there's, you know, about three weeks. So there's some time and certainly things may change depending on how things progress. Um, relative to the statement that masks help, um, I don't think we're seeing that in any significant way and we've even seen the CDC walk that back, certainly relative to class, uh, cloth masks. In fact, they've seen that there really has been no statistical difference. And again, we started this uh, segment saying, look, um, we've got two counties to our north, Arapahoe and Adams, with not just school mandates, they've got mandatory indoor masking and they are on the same curve that we're on. Um, so that data would seem to indicate that the masks, um, they may have a micro effect against COVID, but we also know that they have potential deleterious effects regarding mental health, learning in the classroom, masking people's faces, social emotional issues of being able to connect to people. Um, you know, so again, before we go down and, and we're, we're here a little bit of it, so I'll acknowledge it. Before we go down the, we are going to direct people into masks. We've already decided that question, as it was said. Uh, the ship has sailed. I think the only two cases we have any directed masking, if I understand correctly, just one more time for clarification, is in those situations where we have ADA accommodation in two classrooms, we have some directed masking. And, and frankly, I've talked to parents that are affected that are in that class, and they've been very reasonable uh, to accommodate 
an individual that's in that class, and I thank them for that. Um, the second case is in an outbreak, and only an outbreak case, and only those that are affected by an outbreak, and you will be notified if you are one of those members, you will be asked to go through the outbreak matrix, which will involve not mandatory testing because we don't know availability or anything there. We ask you not to return to school or in the work environment if you have any symptoms. And that is the only time other than the ADA accommodation that there is any There's mask. One, okay. one, other, sorry, one other, and that is just again on, on our transportation, our buses. Yeah. And that is a federal law that we are following federal law and, and masking will continue on buses till further notice. So so just to back up, I think I don't know if we're at this point, if we're we're making any headway. I think we've had a very good discussion. I think the superintendent has some action items out of this that he's at least inferred. Uh, I think one of the biggest one for the board, in addition to the rest of the district here is um, Let's talk about what should be on that agenda for the meeting with the county commissioners. Let's talk about what things, and, and by the way, let's not just make it only a COVID thing. Yeah. Let's let's look yeah. for other areas, right? So um, certainly I will reach out uh, as the president of the board to solicit what do the county commissioners want to talk about. And I will certainly accept suggestions from our other board members on what do our individual board members want to talk about in terms of partnership with Douglas County. Um, but I think one of the good things we can take out of tonight as we wrap it up is I think there's some more clarity. Bottom line is unless you're in an outbreak status or you're in one of the ADA things or you're getting on a bus, there is nothing mandatory required. There are a lot of recommendations and there is definitely an urging towards prudence, personal responsibility, being vigilant, uh, vigilant uh, monitoring systems, and when in doubt, just err on the side of common sense and caution and, and stay home as a professional. And I think the other message we really took was the superintendent and his staff and everybody is doing an incredible job flexing with, uh, with the subs, uh, with all the personnel, with our wonderful bus drivers, with our custodial staff, and they are trying to make it happen. But we are aware that this can only go on so long, it will be monitored, and we will continue to be flexible. And I would say the only other thing I'd suggest we take under advisement immediately and take some recommendations from the superintendent is I think we have some pretty good consensus that we may wanna look at the schedule. And if you would bring to us, if you think there, we might want to bring in build in a Friday or something, again, looking at the school calendar, please bring it to the school board and we can add it to, I don't know if we need to vote on it in the agenda or we can just give you the nod to please take mental breaks to try to get an extra recharge day for an entire community, but especially our staff and our substitutes. Yep, so, so I'm gonna say this with every idea, there's not one simple answer, even on mental health days, for levels, the one level that's the most difficult on giving a day off is high school level, okay? That's instructional minutes. So when you say we wanna give a mental health day, the one thing we have, we have roughly, you know, three instructional days that we call snow days that could also be used for that. Um, now the good part, depending on how you, you measure good, right? The good part is we haven't had any snow days to this point. Uh, that's not always good for, for snowpack and moisture in our community and our lawns. At the same time though, uh, I have to be real with this, that when you say mental health day along with those days off, uh, once you pass a threshold for instructional minutes and, and sometimes it's a few schools have that impact. So we will come back with a plan. Uh, I know Matt, I saw his face, you said uh, uh, mental health day. He's like, oh. Um, <laughs> But the good part is Matt is great with this plan and we look at the impact on it. But I also say that's the same thing we've talked about. What, how can we give, and you've seen that with other districts where they give a mental health day, we're gonna take this day off. Um, similar to snow days in that same effect. So yes, uh, we want to look at that. Yes, it's a very good idea. Uh, but to the entire system and everybody out there that, that the last delayed start I can't tell you the number of people that wanted it to be a snow day. Uh, give us a day. Uh, Everybody wants that, but we have to go back and look at the parameters with that. Um, just like tonight, when we, you know, when we say the answer is, can you have then the mask for a period of time? Every district is facing this. There's not one answer. There's levels of impact, levels of positive impact, negative impact. And we're gonna measure over time, um, but absolutely love the idea. Let's explore it. Um, we want to build that for our staff. Uh, 
but reality, we have to look at some dynamics with that um, because we think that's the quick, easy answer. And even we do it right now, but then also we have an extra couple of like snow days. We, we, let us work through that and we'll do that. What's that? Yeah, early release and time. How we give the gift of time is what we'll look at. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah so. and, and I think the one last thing, and, and then I'd like to move on and, and we can move to our last uh, bit of stuff, is I think it's explicit, but continued and greater coordination reaching out to Douglas County Board of Health. And anything that you need help with or assistance in, in the matrix on what would be the impact of this, help us as assess this, please make sh help us because I don't, th I think we, the one place we really want to avoid going uh, that we were here earlier in the, in the school year was where we get out of alignment with the rest of Douglas County. Uh, I think we want to continue to coordinate with our county government. I think we want to coordinate with our board of health. We want to continue to consult with them and leverage the experts uh, and help them guide us and help them guide yourself as the superintendent and where we are and where we could go and what the impacts of some of the decisions you're considering may have. Uh, but I think more communication during these next couple of weeks would be better. And if you need our liaisons, which are directors Meek and, and uh, directors William to attend or, you know, be that conduit back to the rest of the board on what's being done, Please, I know they're available or we'll have someone else step in as well. And, and Director Peterson, if I may, just uh, to, to your point, um, while, we, while I don't have necessarily uh, you know, ongoing contact with the, the Board of Health, uh, the, the Douglas County Health Department, it, it's hourly. We, we are in such sync with them um, and, and really very, very appreciative of our partnership with them. I, I have to give them incredible kudos. They've uh, really stepped up their, they, they hired an epidemiologist, um, somebody that we worked with very closely. It's the same thing. So, yeah, so, so Jogan is essentially Douglas County Health Department. But not, and, and, and so, the, yeah, thank you for clarifying that. I, I get a little bit sloppy in my language. No, so Douglas County Health Department is, um, they, they've contracted with Jogan, and Jogan has further contracted with, with an epidemiologist on their staff now. And, and I, I tease Celia, our, our nurse coordinator, that, uh, you know, she, she seems to almost have a flirtatious relationship because she's, she's calling them every hour um, to, uh, to, to discuss something. Um, I'm like, Celia, come on, I, I, need, I need to get an update. She's like, I'm on the phone with our partners, but I, I'm, I'm teasing, but our partners have been incredibly responsive, um, have poured in hours with us on this and continue to, to, to say, t talk to us, what do you need? What more do you need? What more do you need? I, I, I don't know where the relationship is between the Douglas County Health Department and necessarily where necess the, the Board of Commissioners are. Th that's not our domain. And, and I can give another bit of input for us. The Board of Health, are interviewing for the director. So when you look at the health department and they'll be interviewing for the director and in that side, so they'll be hiring that piece on top of then partnering even more with Jogan and others. Uh, but they're in that process now of starting to interview and then we'll be hiring for that role too, okay? And I wanna say it was coming up th this weekend, but I know it's coming up this week uh, from what I heard in the update. Anything we can do to continue that partnership at your level with the Department of Health, at the board level with the Board of Health, and then again, you know, we have that scheduled meeting with the county commissioners to get on the same page is good, and 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 I will lend my support to them, um, make them make the board available through me, uh, and again, I think uh, we need to get some ideas for what we're going to talk about on the first with them, um, but but back each other on. We've been very clear as a board. We said back on the 7th, we want to move in this direction. Omicron has come up. We're handling it. By we, I mean the superintendent and his staff is doing a good job of keeping the educational mission going forward. And we're all looking forward to getting to whatever's on the backside of Omicron. And I, I hope it's all just a free booster for everybody and we can ride this natural immunity through the rest of the year. With that, unless there's any final things, I'd like to... Yeah, yes, go ahead, Director Meek. Um, just on the mental health day, and I'm speaking as one, one board director, um, 
I would hate to see us settle on that idea. And maybe there's another idea out there that makes more sense. And so, you know, maybe it's a floating health day, but to me, one day doesn't really feel like it's going to be adequate either. So I just wanted to make sure that that comment is out there. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. And, and bottom line is whatever direct or uh, superintendent wise, you and the cabinet come up with for honoring the intent of time, break, recuperation, mental breaks is, is all excellent. Okay, with that, let's move on to, uh, we only have a few things left, which is president and vice president items, followed by board director announcement and comments. And then uh, we'll actually look to adjourn and then go into executive session. So for item number seven, president and vice president items, um, Agenda planning for the 25th January school board meeting is scheduled for this Thursday, the 13th at 1130. Uh, as mentioned a couple times, we do have a joint meeting between the Board of Education and the Board of County Commissioners scheduled for February 1st, uh, 1230 to 2 p.m. Again, agenda items to be determined uh, jointly. And then we moved our Board of Education retreat originally scheduled for 22 January due to availability that is now scheduled for uh, Saturday, the 5th of February. And that is all the items I have. Uh, Vice President Williams, do you have any? I'll bridge the gap to the next one. Um, okay, so um, I actually just wanted to touch on something that you had said earlier um, about potentially looking at, and I know that it was discussed about having sub- um, from the board, and I recognize that there is a policy that states that that, that can't happen, um, but I would really encourage us to maybe consider, and I know we can't do anything tonight because we can't take any action, um, but just if there's still a need in two weeks, maybe it gets put on the agenda to talk about um, just making a short-term exception, um, nothing long-term, but just to kind of help fill a need if uh, that's just something I'd like to see if it's possible. At this point, I'll open up to any of the other directors for their comments or announcements. Director Meek. So thank you all for indulging me on the report that I handed out tonight. I would love to have feedback from each of the board directors and see if there is interest in some of the ideas that are set forth with linking to our ownership and community. Um, the plan lists LRPC in there as, so there's a couple of examples of linkage. Um, I, I listed it because they will be at the next board meeting as part of our work session. And so they're in there and then the Board of County Commissioners meeting is in there, but it's not complete. It just has a couple of ideas for, for getting us started. Um, we did have planning for the retreat, and so I don't know if talking through the topics might be helpful or if that's something maybe that could be covered at a future meeting, but I think all board members might appreciate hearing that. And then I'll give it back to you and you can do that if that's good. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to um, weigh in on, I did hear you, Mike, say we have a resolution. <laughs> Um, dealing with equity. And so the word we, I, I'm not part of that we. So I haven't seen a resolution dealing with the equity policy. So I don't know if maybe you would expand on that a little bit more, maybe make it out there so people can see it or explain it. That would be helpful. Sure, and a comment on both of those. Uh, I unfortunately do not have the uh, agenda items. We did do agenda planning yesterday. Uh, Director Meek was there, very involved in it. Uh, I can say that it was developed from a lot of comments that were made from the dais. Specifically, a lot of them came from Director Ray around resolutions when they're appropriate, uh, resolutions versus uh, policy changes versus changes to ends uh, in some of the larger documents. So I, I think that'll be a welcome discussion. Um, we will get that finalized. I know the directors have uh, seen a draft on that and it'll come out and we will look to get that posted um, uh, early is, if we can. I know the staff is still working on and refining it, but I would say the general themes are um, board coordination, getting to know each other, uh, working through the um, 
aspects of policy governance. What does it mean to be a policy governance board? I know there is uh, a review of mission, vision, and ends, just so when, now that we have four new directors, uh, we are looking to make sure we have consensus agreement and alignment around what those ends are. So more of that discussion will center around what is in the lanes of the board and what is appropriate to the board and when do we cross over to the execution and implementation uh, to the superintendent and staff. I know that those are some subjects, um, but, but generally it's a, a way for us to take a look at ourselves. Where are we as a new board that has come together? How can we best cooperate, find common ground and move uh, forward together and ultimately support the superintendent and the district in the work that they need to do. So uh, I'll also let Superintendent Wise comment on that. Yep, so you're, you're about spot on. So draft agenda to go through, uh, roughly starting at 8.30, welcome and, and work with the Emergenetics. Uh, what's that look like with uh, our work together and who we are building as a piece, uh, getting in them board norms. Uh, so going back to it, uh, President Peterson said, uh, building in some cabinet work with uh, our work together, merge who we are as a team, what, what those bring on top of common ground. Uh, that then transfers into clarity and alignment of understanding, mission, vision, uh, representation, policy governance with ends. Uh, in the afternoon, then agreements around board communication. What does board communication look like? Decision-making process, needs for board and professional development. What, what do you want to need uh, as individuals and as a group? Uh, continuing then in resolutions, discussion on common understanding resolutions versus policy and use, how we monitor resolutions, and then summary and closure. Uh, prioritize uh, what are our priorities and start to prioritize around that uh, and start talking about the, uh, the end of year debrief sessions to, to go forward of what are our next steps as a board and superintendent. And, and then just backing up to the, uh, the resolution, uh, Director Weininger is running point on that. She is uh, putting together a draft, uh, socializing it with some members of the community, including uh, some of our fine folks over at FAIR, which have a very balanced and, and even mind on this. And, and we will definitely have that posted prior. Um, but I can reiterate what I've seen from the draft. The general intentions of the resolution is to uh, basically ask our, our superintendent to bring back to the board from his equity advisory council and the rest of the community and the staff um, any language they think could better clarify the current ADB policy so it is not a is not a resolution to cancel ADB uh, or rescind it at this point it is simply to give the superintendent time to work with the community and have more voices added to that um, there's a belief by many people that have uh, been expressed to me that there seems to be a misalignment between what was intended in ADB, inclusion, belonging, uh, respect, all those things, and some things that have been implemented. So I think there's three points, if I remember, in the draft resolution still being worked on. One is to ask for additional input to the board, more voices to include the voice of the Equity Advisory Council, which is just electing officers tomorrow night. So they're, they're just getting into their own. Uh, the second one is to reaffirm that parents, uh, you know, explicitly have the role, uh, the primary role, uh, back to a comment that, uh, Mr. Rundle made earlier, um, that parents do have the primary role in shaping their, raising their students and shaping the beliefs and values, but the board has the role, the Department of Education has the role in educating the students um, and working on respectful behavior so we can have academic excellence. And then the third point is simply to saying we absolutely do support what we believe the good elements of equity to be, inclusion, diversity, belonging, respect, all those things. But we also, there are some things we definitely do not want to condone and get into in implementation, things around race essentialism, um, things around compelled speech, um, things around uh, limiting anybody and putting them into a group and setting groups against each other. It's really there to emphasize our commitment for equity at the individual level and avoid putting groups against groups. So again, we'll wait for some more details. We'll, we'll get it out. And uh, it's again, something that we'll look forward to having a discussion around uh, on the 25th. Yeah, so just for transparency purposes, I have asked to meet with FAIR. I've, ha I've asked to attend their meetings and I've been told that I'm not welcome. And I said, so they're not open and transparent. And she said, no, 
they would not want me at their meetings. So I guess I'm just a little concerned that we are allowing an organization that wouldn't allow a board member to attend meetings influence the resolution. But I'd be happy to talk with you more about that later. Sure, I'd be happy to take it offline as well. Uh, again, it, it hasn't been, frankly, I don't, I have not reached out to FAIR as the organization, but I have reached out to individual members that I think are good voices and moderating voices, that, it, frankly, in the community. Uh, go ahead, Director Ray. Just one other um, ask. We know that this is a pretty emotionally charged issue in our community. And so what I'd hate for us to do at the next meeting is pass a resolution on a first reading. I would really recommend that we have two readings uh, so that it gives us time to study, gives our community time to understand what is being asked in the resolution as opposed to being blindsided and all of a sudden, boom, we have to make a decision. I think that was what was difficult with our previous resolution as we said we would take some time. Uh, we would, I think you used the term slow burn, um, Mike, and then all of a sudden, boom, it was on our agenda to vote for. So I would just encourage us to consider doing two readings of whatever resolution you're developing. And I'm fine with the fact that you're developing. I think that's great that we can have some conversation, but let's not put our board in a emotionally charged position where we have to make a rapid decision without a lot of conversation and a lot of community uh, input. Yeah, thank, you. thank you for that input, Director Ray. And again, we'll, we'll take it under advisement. Um, uh, I think one of the lessons learned is rather than go in and try to modify the policy, one of the nice things here is part of that slow burn is just asking for very deliberate feedback to the board. And, and ultimately, again, we're gonna have that conversation at retreat, resolution, policy, ends, things like that. But I think uh, what we want to do is continue a conversation around this because it is so emotionally charged. And we talked about communication at the beginning and getting those really loud voices seem to come in on either side. Man, I have heard from uh, one side of the equity uh, fight that thinks that, you know, that, that claims that schools are indoctrination mills and all teachers, uh, that's not true, <laughs> right? Um, but we've heard the other side as well, that, that there wants to be a banning and whitewashing of history and only telling good things and not talking about uh, some uncomfortable aspects of history and other things there. That is also not true. So again, I think this conversation is not something that's going to end this month. It's something that's going to continue through. It's something that we're going to have to talk about. There's a lot of talk in our ends, something that we will continue to talk about in the retreat, and ultimately we'll talk about through the rest of the, rest of the semester. But uh, again, just for those folks that are still uh, listening, th it is a highly charged issue, and I think the real task for this board, for this district, and for the community, and everybody that's going to have a voice in this conversation is, what really is the common ground? Because I think when we have these um, respectful conversations and we have respectful voices uh, there, we talked earlier about that, I think we can actually find the common ground on this and, and, and get aligned around the language, the intent, and really isolate what is that center part in this thing called equity that everybody values and frankly every time i've talked to parents that have spoken at the dais and said we this policy is horrible when i've had a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation i said well what do you like and what do you want to achieve it's the exact same thing that i hear from the people that have spoken for the policy so there's a lot of common ground there and i look forward to finding it as we go forward together so when it's highly charged go slow to go fast and if we have a resolution that says Here's the things we like, here's the things we don't like. I guarantee you that's not going to be well received by our community. So I just, I, I agree totally, we have to have continued conversations. I don't think it takes a resolution to make that happen. I think that's what we've agreed to from day one with the Equity Advisory Council. We wanted to take this slow, we wanted to get our community uh, informed, engaged, and have conversations. But I think if we put a resolution that says thou shalt and thou shalt not, we will get a reaction that I don't think is going to cause us to have the understanding that you're hoping for. 
Understood, and, and that's why we'll get the resolution out. We'll have folks be able to look at it and, and talk about, you know, what things are desirable. And, and frankly, you, you know, we may have people read it and say, well, of course those things are desirable. We'll commit to those. Again, uh, I'll, we'll take it under advisement, so thank you. Go ahead, Director Meek. Sorry, my, um, I just want to agree with what David just said. I think taking time, allowing people to have opportunity to weigh in and share is extremely important. But I think I heard you say something about directing the superintendent to refine something in the policy, and that is not his job for policy at all. So I just wasn't sure if that's what I heard. No, what you heard was a request for the superintendent to recommend to the board what we may define. It's a board policy, ADB, and it's obviously the, the board's purview, but we would like to get input. Uh, the, the Equity Advisory Council is not a board committee. It's a council and it works for the superintendent. It's a request to ask him to leverage um, his expertise in multiple voices and then bring to the board for the board's consideration anything that we should consider that, that may improve the policy. All right, and with that, um, any other directors, any other announcements or comments? All right, having heard none, um, we move on to uh, items nine and 10, which would be to actually adjourn the meeting to convene an executive session. Um, so the recommendation is that the Board of Election adjourn the study session convene in, to convene an executive session, a closed session for the purposes of considering the purchase, acquisition, lease, transfer, or sale of real, personal, or other property pursuant to CRS section 246402 subsection 4A and holding conference with the district's attorneys to receive legal advice on specific legal questions pursuant to CRS section 2464024B, uh, including conferences to receive legal advice regarding uh, the transfer or sale of real property. Um, do I have a motion as recommended? I motion to adjourn our study session and move into exec session for the purposes stated. Okay, we have a motion by Director Ray. Do I have a second? Second by Director Williams. We'll now call the roll. Director Hansen? Aye. Meek? Aye. Myers? Aye. Peterson? Aye. Ray? Aye. Williams? Aye. Weiniger? Okay, this hereby adjourns the uh, study session by a vote of seven to zero, and we will meet in executive session um, in 10 minutes after a break and after comments by our council. I just want to say that there will be members of staff invited into closed session, which will include Superintendent Weiss, Deputy Superintendents uh, Andy Abner and Donnell Hyatt, as well as Chief Operations Officer uh, Rich Cosgrove and myself as General Counsel for the District. Thank you for the clarification and getting that on the record. The study session is hereby adjourned.